In at number 10, Hawkeye. When Hawkeye first appeared in Tales of Suspense issue 57 back in 1964, he was actually a villain of Iron Man's. After a handful of appearances though, he would go on to change his ways and join the Avengers, with pieces of his origin story coming together in following years. After both his parents died in a car accident, Clint and his brother Barney ran away from the orphanage they were sent to, only to join the Carson Carnival of Traveling Wonders. Here Clint befriended the Swordsman, who along with Trickshot trained the young Clint to become a master archer. But when Clint discovered that the Swordsman was actually embezzling money from the carnival, he attempted to turn his mentor over to the police. But instead, Swordsman beat the crap out of him, leaving him for dead. His relationship with his brother and Trickshot went downhill from there too. And at number 9, Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones may be most prominently known for her role in the Defenders, but the character has been on the Avengers team in the past too. Her origin story takes place in New York City, having gone to the same high school as Peter Parker, who she secretly had a crush on. After her family goes on a trip to Disney World and they're driving back home, their car ends up colliding with a military convoy carrying radioactive chemicals. Those are the chemicals that give her her powers. Her family does not survive, and Jessica ends up in a coma for months. After she does come to, she's sent to an orphanage, and later adopted by the Jones family, who re-enroll her at her high school at Midtown High, where she's ostracized by her classmates, except for Peter. And at number 8, Spider-Man. Spider-Man's origin story is a well-known tale. Peter Parker has been by a radioactive spider, he gains impressive new abilities, and after his uncle Ben is murdered, he learns that great power comes with great responsibility. It's tragic, but it's something that has long informed the actions of the web slinger. While that's the most popular iteration of the tale, there is a key plot point that tends to be forgotten when it comes to Parker. He was molested as a child. Revealed in the 1984 issue 1 of Spider-Man and the Power Pack, we learn that Peter was sexually abused by an adult he trusted, someone he thought was a friend named Skip Westcott. He grooms Peter somewhat, showing him porn magazines with Skip saying to Peter, let's conduct a little experiment of our own. Let's see if we can touch each other like the people in that magazine. Peter, who had saved a child in a similar circumstance in the issue, admits that when he's rehashing the tale that he was too frightened to leave, despite being vocal about not wanting Skip to touch him. Peter later admits when he's swinging through the streets of New York that confronting what happened to him made him realize that he was not responsible for what had happened, which is a pretty big darn deal. And at 7, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. When the Maximoff twins first hit the pages of Marvel Comics, it was 1964 and X-Men issue 4 as members of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. They were reluctant villains, but their origin dates back much further than that. Their mother, Magneto's wife Magda, had fled from him when she was pregnant, taking sanctuary at the High Evolutionary. Fearing that her children might be discovered, she flees, leaving them behind. When superhero Miss America gives birth to a stillborn child and dies, the midwife attending her tells the wizard, Robert Frank, that Miss America gave birth to Wanda and Pietro, although he flees too in grief. The twins are then left in the care of two Romani citizens, Django and Mara Maximoff, who raised them. Their adoptive parents are then killed after Django steals bread to feed the family, and their village is set on fire. Wanda and Pietro flee. Later, when Wanda uses her abilities to save a child, an angry mob hunts the twins down until Magneto rescues them, recruiting them for the Brotherhood. And at number 6, Iron Man. While the MCU has adapted Tony Stark's origin story quite seamlessly into a contemporary context, back in the day, when the character first came out in Tales of Suspense issue 39 back in 1963, he was created as the quintessential capitalist. Tony is the son of a wealthy industrialist who becomes a weapons manufacturer, and ends up getting kidnapped in Vietnam by enemy forces after he's injured by a booby trap, causing shrapnel to get lodged into his chest, slowly moving towards his heart. He ends up working with a fellow prisoner, Ho Yinsen, to create a magnetic chest plate to keep the shrapnel from killing him, along with a suit of powered armor, which Stark then uses to escape. If you know anything about American history, you know that Vietnam was one of the most traumatic events to ever occur in both the US and Vietnamese history, and left both nations struggling with some major PTSD for years to come. While the MCU terrorists are arguably just as scary, there's something about Tony Stark being nearly fatally injured in the jungles of Vietnam that makes his initial origin story quite terrifying when you really think about it. Number 5, Pace Pot Pete. Pace Pot Pete was introduced in the 1960s in Strange Tales Volume 1, Issue 104. There he appears as a villain with a particularly powerful paste gun, which he uses to commit crimes by trapping those who get in his way in paste. His backstory was delved into in the 90s in Spider-Man Volume 1, Issue 91, where we learned that Peter Petrusky was a brilliant scientist who invented the polymer substance he uses in his device. Now going by the name of Trapster, it's revealed to us that Peter could have just patented the substance and made himself a fortune, but instead he turned to a life of crime, believing I guess that that was the better option. I'm sorry, in what world is that the better option? 
He'd already done a good amount of work toward like producing an invention that would make him money without becoming a criminal. I don't understand. Number four, Rainbow Raider. This Flash villain was first introduced in Flash Volume One, Issue Two Eighty Six. He is Roy G. Bivolo. I know. Get ready. As a young boy, Roy always wanted to be an artist, but he was born colorblind. Although his technique was perfect, the fact that his choice of colors when it came to his paintings was atrocious meant that he could never be a painter. Sigh. But wait a minute. Can he just paint in black and white? No, apparently not. His father worked hard to build him prisma goggles, which would give Roy the ability to see color, and on his deathbed, handed them over to his son, saying that they would be his compensation. Roy interpreted this to mean that he would be compensated for years of being mocked as a painter and robbed of the ability to actually pursue his career by using the powers of the prisma goggles to start a life of crime. His goal? To steal priceless works of art and zap them of color so that no one can enjoy them, even though you can totally just enjoy it black and white painting. He can also shoot colors at people to make them feel emotions. For example, blue makes you sad. Cause yeah, that's how color rays work, apparently. Number three, White Rabbit. Lorna Dodson first appears in Marvel Team Ups Volume 1, Issue 131, featuring a team up between Spider Man and Frogman that is kind of adorable. When she was a young girl, she was raised as a proper lady, and to escape her strict and boring upbringing, she turned to books. How appropriate, considering us readers often escape in our own way through reading comics. That's where the comparison and relatability might end with Dodson, though. She became obsessed with Alice in Wonderland throughout her childhood, and even in the lap of luxury, she was never quite happy. She was married off at a young age to a very old man who later died and left her a fortune. She could have done anything she wanted with this fortune, but the thing she wanted most was to become an Alice in Wonderland themed criminal. Yep. So that's why she became White Rabbit. Ultimately she was just bored. Also for someone who identifies as a bibliophile, she misquotes Plato, attributing the phrase, if you want something done right, do it yourself, mistakenly to the ancient Greek philosopher when it is often attributed as being a saying of Napoleon Bonaparte and the French playwright Charles Guillaume Etienne. Maybe she didn't read their stuff, I don't know. Number 2. Film Freak Burt Weston was a struggling actor who faked his death to try and gain some attention when he came back from the dead, and revealed that he'd survived. The only issue is that no one noticed he had died. Sad. No one in the public eye seemed to mourn him or care. As a result, Burt Weston stayed dead and Film Freak was born, a villain who quoted movies. Burt had always been obsessed with the villain roles, considering them meteor parts, so he decided to act out his fantasy of being a criminal by actually pursuing a life of crime. So, you know, he can get some notoriety and possibly an award winning film role, proving his abilities by adopting the mantles of famous movie villains like Norman Bates from Psycho. At least that was his original origin story. I don't make this stuff up. Number one, Codpiece. This backstory is about well, just what you think it's about. When Codpiece was a teenager in high school, he was turned down for a date because he was not big enough. The girl in school meant that he was not tall enough, of course, but he interpreted it in a, a different way. All throughout his life, he attributed all his failed romances to this one singular problem. What is a guy to do? Well, turn to a life of crime, I guess. He built himself a giant utility codpiece and attempted to use it to rob a bank in Doom Patrol Volume 2, Issue 70, but was stopped by Coagula, who dissolved his codpiece. No codmobile for him, I suppose. Thank you so much for watching, Nerd Squad. I hope some of the motivations on this list made you laugh a little. I love villains that have outlandish origins and motives. They are not only entertaining, but show us how something that may seem insignificant or small to an observer can mean the world to those who are personally encountering that perceived small experience. Number 10, Hulk. Bruce Banner is still the Hulk in this reality, but instead of being in the wrong place at the wrong time and ending up being exposed to gamma radiation, which would transform him into the Hulk against his will, he was a researcher working for S.H.I.E.L.D. and with the Ultimates to try and rediscover the Super Soldier Serum. Yeah, in the Ultimates, much like in the MCU, everything is kind of connected by this one single thread, this one purpose, the Super Soldier Serum. Bruce would believe he had uncovered the serum and decided against S.H.I.E.L.D.'s better judgement to test it on himself. This would turn him into the monster we'd come to know as the Hulk, but only when Bruce was using the serum. He could not change at will, and his transformation was not initially triggered by intense emotions or rage. However, he would then blend the actual super soldier serum formula extracted from the blood of the revived Captain America, Steven Rogers, with the Hulk serum, which would end up resulting in his transformations becoming a permanent aspect of his DNA. Number Number 9. Electra. While still super heroically fanciful, Electra's backstory in the 1610 universe is just a touch, a touch. 
much more grounded than her 616 counterpart. Instead of her mother being murdered and dying a very violent death, she instead died of breast cancer. Electra was not made to train in martial arts when she was young, but rather enjoyed martial arts. And so she trained in martial arts out of her own interest, with Bruce Lee acting as an inspiration for her, as a fan of his. She ended up becoming a villain all because of a fellow university student who was a jerk, the wealthy Calvin Langstrom who tormented her at school because she was willing to stand up to him and defend others against him. Because of this, he made Electra's life a living hell, attacking one of her friends and even hiring thugs to burn down her father's laundromat business as well as her family home. It was because of this that Electra turned to the dark side. Frustrated that there was no justice for her or any of Langstrom's victims, no matter the crime that he committed due to his wealth and his connections, she ended up attempting to kill him, setting off on a darker path than her fellow friend and vigilante, Daredevil. At one point she's like, Daredevil, you coming with me or are you gonna help this Langstrom guy? And he's like, I'm gonna help this guy? I was like, dude, just go with Electra. Electra's on like a, she's bad, but she's trying to be good, you know what I mean? I don't know, I love bad girls. I'm like, she bad, but she good. And friends, before we move on to the next spot, if you love this list as much as I loved writing it for you, please be sure to show us some love by giving this video a thumbs up. Also give it a thumbs up because I want to tell you more origins. And so if you give it a thumbs up, there's a better chance that'll happen. Number 8, Hawkeye. Hawkeye is actually a lot more mysterious in the Ultimate Universe than the version we have from the main continuity comics. It's even been implied before that Clint Barton might not actually be Hawkeye's true name, but even an alias from the name he was given at birth. So mysterious. Instead of being someone who picked up his skills from swordsmen around the carnival circuit, Hawkeye was a former Olympic archer turned black ops agent who worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. The Earth 1610 story from Hawkeye more mirrors his MCU story where he ends up settling down and having a family but tragically in the Ultimate Universe, when the Ultimates are betrayed by fellow member Black Widow, Hawkeye's family is killed and he is kidnapped, tormented, and interrogated by Natasha's true allies. Don't worry though, he manages to escape. Thank goodness. With only his fingernails as weapons. That's how you know you're cool if you can just fight with fingernails. I don't think I could ever do that. Although mine are pretty sharp, so maybe. Number seven, Bucky Barnes. As opposed to being the camp's mascot like he was in the golden age of Marvel Comics, Bucky here was a young friend of Steve's who joined him on his journey in the military working as a press photographer. Makes sense. Bucky would not go missing before Steve or actually go missing at all. Instead, it would be Steve who went MIA and was presumed dead and Bucky who had to live with this and move on. Bucky Barnes would not become the Winter Soldier, but instead, would live a relatively normal life, returning home and bonding with Roger's fiance, Gail. In fact, the two grew so close that they ended up in a romantic relationship, and Buck would marry Gail instead. By the time Steve returns from the ice, Barnes is now an old man. I like this reality where like Bucky just gets to grow up and like have a normal life. It's pretty cool. Number six, Black Widow. In the reality of Earth 1610, Black Widow never truly reformed, but instead was a spy and villain the whole time. <gasps> Gasp. It turned out that she was a double agent who was only pretending to serve the interests of the United States. While posing as one of their heroes, she was actually still loyal to Russia and the antagonistic team known as the Liberators, of which she was also secretly a member. Shh, don't tell anyone. Her goal was to destroy the Ultimates, and after winning over their trust and even becoming engaged to Iron Man, she betrayed the Ultimates and turned on them, revealing her true colors. Of course, she may have revealed those true colors a little too soon, as Iron Man easily apprehended her and turned her over to the authorities, but not before she could kill his butler Jarvis in cold blood. R.I.P. Jarvis. Number five, Superman. Wait a minute, what? Superman isn't a villain. Well, not in the main continuity, but in the alternate reality of injustice, he most certainly is a villain. How did this come about? Well, after Superman was tricked into fighting Doomsday, only to realize he had been made to hallucinate by the Joker and Harley, who used fear toxin on him. What had actually been happening was that Superman had been fighting Lois Lane, not his nemesis Doomsday. He realizes this all too late, sadly, as he discovers he has killed Lois. Not only that, but she was pregnant. And not only that, but the Joker and Harley had also 
tied a trigger for a nuclear explosion to Lois's heart. As a result, when her heart stopped, Metropolis, Superman's shining city, was blown to bits. It's really no wonder he became such a cold and deadly villain. He felt that he needed to fix the world as a result of these events. Of course, he went about that in a way that I'm sure Lois would not have been proud of had she still been alive to see Superman fight in her and Metropolis's name. Number four, Killer Frost. Killer Frost was originally scientist Caitlin Snow, who had been on the hunt for a perpetual motion energy conducting machine that many believed to be a myth. She sought to continue the research of Dr. Louise Lincoln, who had been working to make such a machine, which she called a self-sustaining thermodynamic ultraconductor engine. Caitlin's colleagues warned her against following in Dr. Lincoln's footsteps, but she paid them no mind. When she finished the engine, they turned on her, revealing their true colors. They were actually working for the evil organization known as Hive, and sought to destroy Snow and Lincoln's work, preventing the invention from ever being used or discovered. They trapped Caitlin within the engine and started it up in order to destroy her. Terrified, Caitlin panicked and tore out the wires for the coolant system. This had an unexpected result, and Caitlin Snow found herself bonded with ice and basically became a heat vampire. With her new ice-based powers, she escaped and killed all of the Hive agents. Craving heat as a result of her condition, she would later discover that exposure to Firestorm's powers temporarily reverted her to normal and would dedicate her life to pursuing him, seeking a permanent cure. Number three, Zombie Spider-Man. I know he's another alternate hero turned villain. But what can I say? They get some of the spookiest origins because they kind of have the most to lose. Heroes like have usually higher stakes than villains. When it comes to Spider-Man's origins in the zombie verse, he was of course infected with the zombie virus, which made him a villain. But as this change came upon him, he found himself tragically and horrifyingly feeding on his own family members that he tried desperately for years to keep safe. Spider-Man started off his brain and flesh eating spree by eating those he'd loved the most in a horrific twist. He devoured Mary Jane and his Aunt May, likely crying all the while, I imagine, but unable to stop himself. He was just so hungry. Number two, Bane. It's really no surprise that Bane became a supervillain considering he grew up in prison, serving time for crimes he did not commit, but that his father committed. Bane's father was a revolutionary who had escaped the prison, and when Bane was just 17, he was imprisoned in his father's place. He spent most of his life inside a cell that was connected to the ocean. All day he would spend in mind-numbing seclusion, alone in his cell, and at night he would have to swim for his life while trying to stay afloat above the water that filled up his prison cell almost to the very top, but not quite. Crabs and leeches would cling to his body, cutting him throughout each tormented night, and insects who happened to be sharing the cell with him would climb up on his face seeking refuge. Every moment he ever spent outside of his cell afterwards would be focused on becoming stronger and smarter, preparing himself to one day escape the prison and accrue power once outside its walls. Number one, Magneto. One of the scariest stories out there in terms of supervillain origins is that of Magneto, made more scary by the fact that it's actually based off of real world circumstances experienced by many victims of the events tied to World War II. Magneto grew up being trapped along with many of his family in a camp by World War II German soldiers. Now, I apologize for not being able to say the words that I would like to say here to give this topic the weight that I think it deserves. I think we all agree. But there are certain words and phrases that we are permitted from speaking on this platform, so I apologize for my lighter turn of phrase here and my potentially perceived levity. I promise I do take this subject very seriously. Um, and if you have problems with the fact that we can't say certain words, I would would highly recommend that you contact the platform and let them know your thoughts on that. Because yeah, I think that's important to do. Young Magneto would not only have to suffer in these camps, but he'd also have to watch as one by one his family members attempted to escape and often got so close to being truly free, only to be reined back in and pretty much all end up dead in the end. He was forced into taking care of the bodies and disposing of all who perished at the camp as well, becoming a Sonder Commando, which must have felt like psychological torture as well as being grueling work. Sonder Commandos were actually real world special units, by the way, that existed during World War II, made up of Jewish prisoners from the camps who were forced into disposing of the victims who had been killed in the camps, threatened with their own deaths if they refused the work. In the end, Magneto did escape, but even then he was met with tragedy. He and his love Magda would escape and start a family, finding a home in a village in the mountains. But after he was revealed to be a mutant, the people turned on him and his family, burning their homes 
home to the ground. As Magneto attempted to save his daughter, who was trapped on the upper floor of their home, soldiers attacked him, preventing him from doing so, and she died in the fire. Number 10, Jean Grey slash Phoenix. So Phoenix is low on here, cause while well, Phoenix is an offshoot of Jean Grey, another persona for her, or at least it was initially. So when Jean became the Phoenix, and get ready for cliff notes here people, Jean Grey came into much more power at that point. This was because she was intended to be the first female cosmic hero. This was after her death as Marvel Girl. Fun fact, fans named the Phoenix Saga the Phoenix Saga retroactively, so after it had come out. So when Jean came into these powers, they overwhelmed her, and she ended up becoming Dark Phoenix. And well, she killed billions, some regenerates and say millions. But this arc proved so popular, writers didn't want to let her go. So they wanted to bring Jean back, but also absolve her of, well, the murder. So there would be no moral dilemma for fans. Enter the Phoenix Force retcon. The Phoenix wasn't a persona or a name, but an actual force that had made a copy of Jean. The real body was in a cocoon under the ocean, and she hadn't killed anyone. So you can have the cake and eat it too. The Phoenix Force would go on to become a big player in the Marvel Universe. This is a beloved retcon by many, and one so old and ingrained some don't even know what happened. Well, I do. We have a phoenix now, cause Jean killed too many people, hence the phoenix origin changed. Number 9. Hal Jordan cannot feel fear So Hal Jordan, the second Green Lantern, given a ring by a dying alien, Abin Sur, known for his ability to overcome great fear. However, this wasn't always the case, or rather it was and then it wasn't. There was a time when it was made canon that Hal Jordan could not feel fear, like he literally couldn't. He was incapable of it, because, and here comes the retcon, his ring removed the ability from his mind when it came to him and he felt fear cause well alien abduction. So the ring fixed that for him. It's also here that's revealed that Hal only got picked cause he was closest. Well, closer than Guy Gardner anyway. So for a time, this was canon, but then people got to thinking, isn't him not being able to feel fear kind of dangerous? Also, the ring is brainwashing people. Also back to doesn't that mean Hal could fly off the deep end? Which he did anyway. So we went back to the ring chose him cause he had the ability to overcome great fear, not that it brainwashed him. Still better than I don't know what Will is. I'll never Never forgive Heroes in Crisis for that. His ring literally would not work. Number 8. Demons killed Frank's family. The tale of the Punisher is a classic. His family is killed in the crossfire of a mob hit or directly murdered by them. And it sends Frank Castle off the deep end and he's gonna punish everyone responsible. And more. As the Punisher. However, there was a time when it wasn't just the mob who killed Frank's family, but also demons. We learned this in the 1990 miniseries Purgatory. So in this story, Frank learned that his family was murdered by a demon who had taken human form as a mobster, who then killed Frank's family because he wanted Frank to be killing in his name, which he had been unknowingly for all those years. This meant that when he sought vengeance, the demon would get the souls of the evil people that Frank killed. Yeah, demons made him do it. It was not a change everyone could get behind. These days we're back to just a good old fashioned murder. Demons running around as mobsters manipulating you. Scary stuff. Number 7. Wonder Woman. Not made of clay and so many other things. Things. So Wonder Woman has a shifting origin, and really, it's how much people can't leave it alone that's the scary thing. She's made of clay. Let her be made of clay. But no, she's born of Zeus. She's rescued and brought to the island. She lost her powers and had to learn Kung Fu. That's not an origin, but it is probably the scariest time for Wonder Woman. The white Kung Fu suit. She had that suit. She was fighting Egg Fu, which was as awful as it sounds. This was largely because Black Widow was so successful, and Wonder Woman was a little stagnant. So DC was like, why not make her a ninja style? fighter. Why not? That was why not. Most people like to forget this happened, but we still mess with the clay origin as recently as the new 52. People just keep messing with it. Leave it alone. Which is your favorite origin for her? Share down below. Number six, the government put Cap on ice. So yeah, this was a thing. Instead of Cap being frozen in heroic sacrifice thawed years later, the government did it on purpose to put him out of commission because they felt he would object to what they felt they had to do to end World War II. So Captain America as a comic series was relaunched a little after 9-11, and well, you can tell, it shows very much so in this storyline. Now, Captain America had never been frozen on ice randomly until Namor found him. No, now he was in suspended animation in a lab, and then Namor found him. I like that Namor finds him either way. It's the golden age bromance bond. So pretty much nobody acknowledges this as a thing. This is very much an of its time type of occurrence, meant to echo certain thoughts that are being bandied about at the time and still are today. But we're back to classic Ice Cap, the origin where he's found on ice randomly. Secret conspiracy? Seriously? Scary. We know what happens when we get too far with Cap. Hail Hydra. Let's move on to another iconic DC character in at number 5. 
Catwoman. Oh yes, an iconic character the caliber of Catwoman can be victimized by a terribly wacky origin story just like any other hero. Selina Kyle first hit the scene in the early days of the Golden Age, appearing in Batman issue 1 from 1940, but she hadn't fully come into her own yet. During her debut, she was merely an expert thief who made use of disguises that made her appear like an innocent elderly woman. But how did she enter this glamorous life of crime and jewel thievery? Well, once upon a time, she was a flight attendant and during one fateful flight, the plane she was working on crashed. She suffered from amnesia as a result. And upon waking, what did she do? She decided that she should start a life of crime. That's a completely rational idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just be criminals. As for the whole cat part of her persona, she chose to adopt the mantle of the cat. She wouldn't be called Catwoman until later on, all due to her daddy dearest having owned a pet store in the past. As you can imagine, DC being the king of reboots and retcons eventually retconned this origin and replaced it with a brand new one in the 1980s after the character had made a comeback in the Silver Age. In our number 4 spot, Shauna the She-Devil Shauna first appeared in a self-titled comic book in 1972. She is a well-trained veterinarian, an Olympic level athlete, experienced in combat and has extraordinary agility. She is also a highly sexually objectified character, but that is not why she landed on this list. Shauna witnessed the death of her mother. Her father murdered her mother. Yikes. She then moved from her home in Africa and came to the US to become an Olympic level athlete and a vet who specialized in raising leopard cubs. Here's where it gets really random. One of the cubs that she was raising was shot at by a zoo guard and feeling the need to protect wildlife better, she moved back to Africa to fight poachers. That's that's it. It's kind of boring. Cool story. I can tell it again if you'd like. Coming in in our number 3 spot, we have Bouncing Boy. Oh, Bouncing Boy. Bouncing Boy is by far one of the silliest superheroes out there. He is a boy who has the power to inflate like a giant ball and of course, bounce around. It also gives him a certain extent of invulnerability. To be fair, he first appeared in Action Comics issue 276 in 1961, and he was a part of the Legion of Superheroes. Bouncing Boy, aka Chuck Tane, is largely thought to be a character created by Jerry Siegel as a means of reflecting Siegel's interest in comedy and a desire to have a vehicle for humor on that team. So, how did Chuck get his powers? Well, he was not born with them. And silly enough, he is the second individual on our list to gain powers from a beverage. No word of a lie, Chuck thought he was gulping down a delicious soda when in fact he had just consumed a super plastic formula. Whatever that is. He was first rejected by the Legion, but after defeating a robber, he was accepted onto the team's roster and became the Legion's self appointed, I quote, morale officer. Morale officer? I mean, like, morale, like, inspirer would make sense, but to be an officer is. Kind of seems like he's bouncing around being like, be happy, you know? Moving on to something even more ridiculous, in at number two, Firebrand. The Firebrand mantle has been held by two individuals, siblings Rod and Danette Riley. Rod Riley was a bored, wealthy socialite who decided he would fight crime alongside his manservant, donning a very flamboyant costume that consisted of a transparent shirt and tight red pants. Now, aside from being a bit of a latent queer superhero, Rod was pretty damn racist. His story had eventually been retconned, making him present at Pearl Harbor during its attack in World War II. So I guess it's justified racism? Ew. <laughs> no thanks. Danette, after finding out her brother was Firebrand, would state, I quote, What a confirmed bachelor playboy like my brother needed with a bodyguard, I never understood. And even better, from the looks of these clothes, I didn't know my brother quite well as I thought I did. In other words, Sweetie, your brother's gay. Speaking of, her origin was a bit more absurd than her brother's. She was studying volcanoes north of Hawaii in the 40s when she was kidnapped by a sorcerer named Wotan. When she tried to escape, Wotan hit her with a magical blast that knocked her into a pit of lava, which then gave her the power to control heat and shoot fire blasts. Which, you know, seems a little absurd because if one was to be thrown into a pit of lava, you would, you would die pretty quickly. Wouldn't be fun. But there is magic involved, so it's fine. And finally, in our number one spot, The Wizard. The Wizard, aka Robert Frank, is the product of the Golden Age, having initially been published by Marvel's predecessor, Timely Comics. First debuting in US Comics issue 1 in 1941, The Wizard not only has a silly name, his origin story is almost baffling. It's that bad. Born in St. Louis, Missouri, Robert Frank was a fellow who went on a trip to Africa with his father. That was where he was bitten by a cobra. An almost fatal bite, his father saved him at the last minute with a blood transfusion from a mongoose. Why? Apparently to counteract the poison. But because of this, Robert was given super speed abilities. Later on, writers tried to make more sense of this by saying that the mongoose blood actually triggered latent metahuman abilities. Yeah, 
Sure, right, that, that makes way more sense. Totally. And that's why he fell into obscurity. Number 10, Swarm. If you have a fear of bees, or more specifically mutated killer bees, then you might find the story of Fritz von Mayer to be terrifying. Mayer became a sometimes Spider-Man villain after his transformation into basically a horde of killer bees. He was a scientist in the employ of the German Axis forces during World War II. Not much is known of his backstory previous to that, but with unlimited funding, he set out to study poisons, toxins, and bees. Finding an apparently mutated hive of bees, he attempted to awaken their killer instincts and seize control of them. But his plan backfired and they ended up gaining back their killer instincts and using them to swarm and kill Mayer. Mayer's consciousness however became absorbed into the bees as his physical form died. And as such, he is now a man who is made up entirely of bees. If that isn't something out of a nightmare, I really don't know what is. Number 9. Swamp Thing Alec Holland is believed by Swamp Thing himself to be the man that the creature once was. Alec Holland and his wife were living out in the swamp and were both scientists who had developed a bio-restorative formula that would solve world hunger. However, goons were to sabotage and destroy the discovery during this original origin story. The goons put explosives in the lab and Alec woke up following the explosion covered in the bio restorative formula. He ran out into the swamp but found himself merged with it becoming an avatar of the green. Merging with that swamp and becoming the monstrous creature known as Swamp Thing. Originally in the comics, Swamp Thing, believing it had once been Alec, was always trying to find a way to return to a more human state, longing to be mortal once more. Number 8. John Constantine We recently got an interesting look into John Constantine's origins in the new DC Black Label limited series Rise and Fall. Hellblazer Rise and Fall. That's the that's the whole long title. This is a story divided up and told over the course of three books. In the first book, we are told of Constantine's backstory and everything that has shaped him into the lovable troublemaker of an occult detective that he has become today. His life started in the dark from the moment he was born. His mother passed away bringing him into the world, which set the stage for what his life would then be like. His father turned to drink and treated young John harshly, never once sympathizing with his son, which only motivated John to become more of a young vagabond, staying out and running around the streets of London late at night. We also learn of the tragic loss of one of his childhood friends in the book. Truly, it's a must read for Constantine fans, or just for fans of good comics. Number 7. Batman The death of Batman's parents and the trauma he suffered from witnessing that as a young boy would forever change Bruce. It would turn him into the vigilante he is today and inspire him to set out on a mission to become the Dark Knight, dedicating his life to an intense training regimen and traveling the world to learn from a variety of masters on a variety of subjects, from detective work to martial arts to magic. To this day, it's still the death of Bruce Wayne's parents that remains one of the most tragic events in his life, still haunting him to the point that he's even seen hallucinating about his parents' death while tripping on Joker venom during the current events of Joker War. Always tends to be the thing he comes back to, that and currently the loss of Alfred. Number 6. Sentry Robert Reynolds was a drug addict who snuck into a lab and discovered the experimental golden Sentry Serum. Though the backstory he'd be given in the comics within the Marvel Universe later on would be much less dark. Consuming the serum granted, Reynolds gained the power of a million exploding suns, making him one of the most powerful superheroes ever known. Although the Sentry was a hero who was known for his Superman-like extreme level of goodness, he had a dark secret. One that was unknown even to him for a very long time. Bob Reynolds suffered from a split personality disorder, in part brought on by the villain Mastermind's manipulations, which meant that he was not only capable of immense good, but immense evil as well, as his personality split into that of the superheroic Sentry and the powerful supervillain known as the Void. When it was revealed that Bob himself was also the greatest villain on the planet, he recruited the help of his superhero friends such as Doctor Strange and Mr. Fantastic to help everyone, including Bob, forget about the Sentry, so that the Void would also never return, making Bob, for a time, the greatest hero that the world forgot. Number 5. Silk Silk just had a really weird life in general, never mind her origin story, although that admittedly is also pretty weird, which is why she's on my list. Sydney Moon was one of those folks who was created as a character later in terms of comic history, but who was woven into the fabric of the original history as though she was kinda always there. She went to the same school as Peter and happened to be bitten by the same radioactive spider. However, she learned much earlier on about spider totems and as a result was hidden away in a bunker for years, growing up without much contact with the outside world. She also has a whole thing tied to Peter when it comes to her origins in terms of her feeling real frisky around him because they're bitten by the same spider, but fortunately that's in the past now. But that was a thing, and it was weird. Number 4. Dog Welder 2 Dog Welder is just straight up weird, and, and I feel like weird is a, is a timid way of 
putting that. I don't know if we'd actually even call him a hero, a straight up superhero, based on the fact that what he does sounds kind of villainous actually, but he is supposedly a part of, you know, a superhero team, albeit a kind of terrible superhero team. But still, I feel like we kind of need to count him, even though I myself am very skeptical about categorizing him as a hero. But he is categorized as such in the comics, so here we go. The original Dog Welder was downright dastardly, but Dog Welder 2, his successor, is at least not really fully in control of what he does and definitely has, you know, one of the weirdest origin stories ever as a result. So at least he's a little bit better, but also weirder. He ended up stumbling upon the original Dog Welder's equipment and became possessed by it, compelled to weld dogs to people. Despite having what seemed to be a happy life with his family, Dog Welder 2 could not stop himself, cannot resist the urge from welding his kids to the dog. As a result, his wife divorced him and later remarried. That's what you do. Also, what a weird story. Also, the fact that he's still holding out hope, like maybe one day I'll be able to talk to them again. I don't think you come back from that, my friend. I think you're done. Number three, Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck hails from a planet known as Duck World, where apparently ducks are not only intelligent, but also, coincidentally, happen to speak English, as so many on Earth do. What a coincidence. As weird as that sounds, though, what's even weirder is the way Howard got to Earth, which is kind of debated in the comics with a few different stories telling this tale. Although I personally like the version where it's mentioned that Florida is basically located at the center of the nexus of all realities of Earth 616, which I think is pretty wild and pretty funny and kind of great. I also love that in that version of the story, that's kind of where like Howard first appeared was in the Everglades in Florida. It's just funny because he obviously is also supposed to be a parody on Donald Duck, so. Yes. Number two, Scarlet Witch. Wanda Maximoff has one of the most simple and yet at the same time convoluted origins in all of comics. Initially, she was simply a young woman who was a mutant and was saved by Magneto alongside her brother Pietro, aka Quicksilver. Feeling indebted to Magneto for saving their lives from an angry mob, they pledged themselves to Magneto's cause, serving him as members of his Brotherhood of Mutants, or Brotherhood of Evil Mutants if you prefer. However, later on, we learned that Magneto was also their dad and that the children were simply adopted by the Maximovs. It's kind of have like two groups of parents. Wanda's magic would go from mutant originating hex powers to being tied to Cthon to chaos magic to simply just magic that was passed down from her mother who was also known for being a powerful witch. And Magneto would go from being unaware father to birth father to emotionally complicated dad to Magneto, you are not the father. And more recently was like more of an adopted father to Wanda and Pietro himself before he kick the bucket. Although he'll probably be back at some point soon if he's not already at the time of this recording. Wanda would go from being mutant outcast to mutant villain to mutant pretender, having been revealed as someone who was simply made to look like a mutant after being experimented on very early in life by the High Evolutionary for some reason, and finally back to being cool with mutants again after she was able to help them access sort of lost consciousness backups for mutants long thought lost and therefore unresurrectable. Basically, Scarlet Witch is just weird. It's, that's the only way it goes. Doesn't matter what part of the origin story we're at, it's crazy. Number one, Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones is another one of those characters who is retroactively given close ties to other heroes, with her character having been created later on in the early 2000s. But if you thought Silk was wild, Jessica goes pretty crazy into that. She had a crush on Human Torch, went to the same school and was in the same grade as Peter Parker, and her dad worked for Tony Stark. What? She would end up being exposed to radioactive chemicals in a tragic car crash that the rest of her family perished in. During her first flight, where she lost control of her powers, Thor saved her. Thor. Shortly after this, Jessica would take up the superhero name of Jewel and would end up almost immediately afterward being controlled by the Purple Man and forced to do what he bid her. All in all, her origin is pretty messed up and also just pretty wild. Starting us off in at number 10, Hit Girl. But it's really no more painful than a punch in the chest. Why are you getting punched in the chest? You're gonna be fine, baby doll. <laughs> Hit Girl has always been a controversial character, especially after the live action kick ass film came out. She brings up a lot of ethical debates about the concept of child superheroes, and she is a superhero who makes use of a whole lot of violence. The character first appeared in issue 3 of the kick ass comic book series as a 10 year old assassin who works alongside her vigilante father, Big Daddy. He's trained her since she was born. The two of them are out to seek revenge for Hit Girl's mother's, the two of them are out to seek revenge for Hit Girl's mother's death caused by the mob. Or at least that is what Hit Girl thought they were doing. Turns out that was a lie. 
Big Daddy actually kidnapped Hit Girl when she was a baby, manipulated her into hating the mob, and also Democrats, lols. And there was never a mother in the picture. Big Daddy was just a comic book nerd living out a fantasy of fighting crime. This origin story was skimmed over as far as the film adaptations were concerned. Wonder why. In at number 9, The Hulk. Did you know that Bruce Banner's problems with rage spread from child abuse? The Hulk's origin story is one that many people are familiar with. Bruce Banner was exposed to gamma radiation while trying to save an innocent kid, turning him into the Hulk uncontrollably whenever he got mad. But there's more to his origin than that. Revealed in a 1985 issue of The Incredible Hulk, fans learned that Bruce was abused as a child by his father, who was a violent alcoholic. His father would beat him and accidentally killed Bruce's mother too. Bruce's dad was afraid of his son because of how intelligent he was, even when Bruce was just an infant. In addition to that, after receiving psychiatric treatment in 1991, he would become Professor Hulk, a way more controlled, mellowed version of himself. He even wore full blown outfits. This did not last long though. Apparently Professor Hulk was just an aspect of Banner's personality and he wasn't fully cured after all, returning to his angry self eventually. In at number 8, Big Bertha. Eating disorders are no laughing matter. But apparently when Big Bertha was conceived in 1998 and introduced in West Coast Avengers Volume 2 Issue 46, their creator John Brynn didn't have tact in mind. Big Bertha aka Ashley Crawford is a character who can control her body mass and the distribution of fat on her body. When she grows large, something that she did to gain membership on the Great Lakes Avengers team, she's Big Bertha, capable of lifting incredible amounts of weight. But when she's just doing her thing in day to day life, she's crafted a thinner body, turning herself into an actual supermodel. In order to return to her supermodel size, she throws up all of her excess weight. So yeah, that's bulimia. And that is a pretty f thing to put in a comic. Or at least in that light. In at number 7, Green Lantern Kyle Rayner. You'd think with a hero as prominent as Green Lantern, DC would put a lot of effort into crafting an origin story for a new iteration of the character taking up the mantle, right? Wrong. Let's talk about Kyle's origin story. A very undeserved one, in which the character picked up the mantle from Hal Jordan, who had been put through the rigor in leading up to 1994 with the Emerald Twilight story arc. Along came Kyle, a freelance graphic artist who randomly becomes a Green Lantern when he wanders out back of a heavy metal club to discover a guardian dying there. The little blue dude starts speaking to Kyle, confuses the dude bro who thinks he's hallucinating. He's also wearing a Nine Inch Nails t-shirt, might I add. And he takes the ring, not even getting an explanation for what it really does. That's that. That's how he gets his ring. And at number 6, Harley Quinn. For a very long time, Harley Quinn was characterized by her abusive relationship with the Joker. As his devout follower and girlfriend, despite the affection often being unrequited, Harley Quinn used to be Harleen Quinzel, a psychiatrist who worked at Arkham and was manipulated so badly by the Joker that she lost her mind, she became obsessed with him, and eventually allowed him to toss her into a vat full of acid to fully transform her into his lover and accomplice. In recent times, she's removed herself from the Joker, going on her own adventures as more of an anti-hero, and even developed a romantic relationship with her longtime pal Poison Ivy. Number 5, Jessica Drew. I'm not sure how to describe Jessica Drew's origin story, which has also changed over the years, like most of our favorite Avengers and Marvel characters. Is her story scary? Yes. But is it also a strange combination of weird and tragic? Yes. Her original origins, when she first appeared in the comics in 1977, was that she was actually a spider who had turned into a human. However, the story of how she came to have her powers changed once Marvel realized that this idea might be too out there, even for their readers and even for the 70s. Instead, her story now follows that her dad was a geneticist who sort of accidentally but also kind of purposefully uh, poisoned his daughter with uranium exposure. Um, yeah, their, their home was on a giant uranium deposit and he thought that was fine. In order to save her, but also as a kind of weird experiment, he injected her with an arachnid serum, created based around his knowledge of the regenerative properties of spider blood. This worked, but due to the fact that it was a slow process, Jessica had to be kept in stasis during the healing time. By the time she was all better, she awoke from stasis as an adult woman, without really any experience in growing up. Not only is that freaky enough, but she also ends up discovering her newfound powers when she accidentally kills the first person she has a romance with. Oh yeah, she also gets brainwashed by Hydra. <laughs> Poor Jess. Number 4, The Fantastic Four. I just realized I made them number 4. All four of the Fantastic Four have joined the Avengers at one point or another. Unsurprisingly, in my opinion, as the Fantastic Four seem to be the Marvel team to connect almost all Marvel teams, having some kind of relationship with almost 
every Marvel character. For their origin story, we have to flip way back in comic book history to the early 60s. A rocket ship's test flight goes awry when Reed Richards, Susan Storm, Johnny Storm, and Ben Grimm are exposed to cosmic rays as they break through the Earth's atmosphere. These cosmic rays transform them into the Fantastic Four. When put that simply, it sounds fine and, you know, kind of awesome. But as many of the film adaptations and Ben Grimm's suicidal moods have demonstrated, the Fantastic Four origins are definitely more horror story than Cinderella story. Number 3, Wolverine. Another gruesome one for the books. Wolverine joined the Avengers team in the new Avengers series. Another X-Men as well whose mutation was brought on by a traumatic experience. Maybe that's in part why Logan and Rogue have such an intense bond. Logan was the legitimate son of Elizabeth Howlett, who had an affair with his father, Thomas Logan, the groundskeeper of his mother and her husband's huge estate. Logan grew up being abused by his grandfather and also traumatized by his half brother, who killed his puppy. He discovered he was a mutant after watching his biological father murder his mother's husband, who was kind of like a father to him, in cold blood. And of course, Wolverine's abilities involve claws, which tear through his skin, so. You could imagine just how terrifying that must have been. And that is just the beginning of his origins. <laughs> Let me tell you, it does not get much better from there. Including, but not limited to, Logan being raised by wolves, only to have his wolf family murdered by a polar bear. Number 2, Deadpool. Lovable, violent, and tragic. Probably the three words that describe this anti-hero and, that's right, Avenger, the best. Wade Wilson is also known for being mentally ill and unstable, which means that his backstory has always been somewhat unclear as it seems hard for him to remember it. Ryan Reynolds' first Deadpool film gave us a glimpse of his comic book origin story, and while some details were left out, the film followed the same trajectory. Namely, that he broke up with his girlfriend, also Vanessa in the comics, due to his uncurable cancer and that he agreed to be tested on by Weapon X. As a result, he was granted healing powers which eventually ended up leaving him scarred. Oh. And he also had a friend in the warehouse slash hospital where they were kept. And there was even an Ajax, so not super far off, but still equally scary and upsetting. Number one. Punisher. Obviously, I had to make Punisher my number one. His origin story to me is the most tragic and terrifying. Why? Because imagine if you were in Frank Castle's shoes. The Punisher, aka Frank Castle, served in the military and during one of his times on leave, ended up with his family in Central Park, where they stumbled upon mob dealings they were not meant to see. Fearing witnesses, the mobsters murdered Frank Castle, his two children, and his wife. Unfortunately, Frank managed to survive and was left with the loss of his family and a need for revenge that was denied him by the courts and police as they were being controlled and corrupted by the very mafia that took out Frank's family. Castle decided to take matters into his own hands and adopted the mantle The Punisher, swearing to get revenge for his family by any means necessary, making him a huge anti-hero similar to Deadpool but much more serious. You can explore Castle's level of hurt and just how far Punisher is willing to go to fight for revenge in Netflix's Daredevil series and their Punisher series. He respectfully joins the Avengers ranks in the Savage Avengers series. Number 10, Doctor Strange. Doctor Stephen Strange was an accomplished and world-renowned surgeon until a tragic car accident. While he survived the crash, the nurse in his hands were severely damaged, making it impossible for him to recover well enough to return to his work as a neurosurgeon. Strange was egotistic to the point that he refused to do any other work in the medical community, attempting to use all of his funds to try and find a cure for his hands, and eventually sinking into a deep depression and alcohol addiction. Previous to his accident, it was his parents' death and the fact that he found great success early on that caused him to become materialistic in his pursuits, caring less and less for his patients and more and more about the acclaim and the money that he was making. Eventually, he heard of the mystical power of the Ancient One and used his last bit of money to set out to see if they might possess healing abilities strong enough to heal him. From there he would become a reluctant, stubborn, and eventually extremely loyal and determined student, and would go on to become the new Sorcerer Supreme and magical hero known as Doctor Strange. Number 9, Iron Man. Tony Stark has led quite the privileged life, basically being born with a silver spoon in his mouth. So you might think he's got it made when it comes to superhero origins. But let's not forget what it took to get him to build and operate his Iron Man suit, and what inspired him to become a hero. Tony Stark was giving a demonstration of his technology to the military when there was an explosion. Stark was injured and taken prisoner by a terrorist who wanted to use his brilliant mind to have him create weapons for them. Shrapnel lodged into Tony Stark's chest, moved ever 
closer to his heart. And it was the help of another brilliant prisoner, Nobel Prize winner and physicist Ho Yinsen, whom Stark admired, that allowed Tony to survive and inspired him to build the Iron Man Mark I armor, which allowed him to escape but at the cost of Yinsen's life, and put him on the path to becoming a hero. Number 8. Rocket Raccoon Rocket Raccoon in the Marvel Cinematic Universe alludes to his character's dark origins when he gets into an argument with the other Guardians of the Galaxy, insisting they consider him to be a joke, and revealing that there is a lifetime of pain in his past which gives him the form and personality that he has today, as a being who was heavily experimented on, being torn apart and put back together more times than he can count. Previous to this origins though in the comics, Rocket was simply one of a group of animals given heightened intelligence and awareness by robotic beings, who sought to escape their duties of looking after mental patients in their care. Rocket was one of the animals who stepped in to take on these duties. Later on however, even in the comics, while out exploring space, he would be abducted and taken to a place known as Lab World, where he was then studied and experimented on. Number 7. Two-Face Harvey Dent went from being on the side of the law and one of the biggest real life everyday fighters for justice in Gotham to becoming one of the city's most iconic villains. It all started when he was disfigured. During a trial, crime boss Sal Maroney threw acid in Dent's face, scarring him for life and driving him insane. Dent lost his faith in justice as a result of this incident and instead left it up to fate to decide whether he would behave heroically or criminally, often known for flipping a coin to decide his victim's fate. Number 6. Spider-Man Spider-Man's whole brooding and moody sensibility and his battle with depression, which would only grow over time, all stems back to his origins. The death and loss of Uncle Ben is what inspired Spider-Man to become a hero and also gives him a lifetime of weighty regret. Uncle Ben's death could have been avoided in Spider-Man's mind if only he'd cared enough to use his powers to stop a thief in his path, who would shortly after end Ben's life. To Peter Parker, he may as well have pulled the trigger himself. This tragic and dark story would inspire the hero to use his powers more responsibly, but would also haunt him for the rest of his life. Number 5. Green Lantern For this origin tale, we are going all the way back to the first Green Lantern, Alan Scott, who also technically isn't really the same kind of Green Lantern as those who would come after him. Instead of being given his powers by the Lantern Corps and the Guardians of the Universe, Scott was basically given his powers and saved by the Green Lantern of Life, later established as an entity held prisoner by the Guardians known as Darkheart. In the original story in All American Comics issue number 16, the green light first crash landed to Earth and used its flame in China to bring death, then in America, new life, curing a man who was once insane, and finally saving Alan Scott and granting him the gift of power. Which I also feel like that's kind of weird because it's like, it, first there was death, then there was life, now there's power. But, I'm like, but you also saved Alan Scott's life, so technically it was like death, life, life, power, life, power. It's like two gifts. Really. Number 4. Dazzler One of my all time favorite heroes in the comics, Alison Blair, definitely has a strange origin. She is a mutant which, relative to comics, is not actually that strange of course because there are many mutants. In Marvel Comics there are many many other ones at this point that exist and they have actually become probably some of the most popular groups around in terms of the comic publisher. However, even among mutants, Alison's story is kind of odd. After learning her mutant powers, she was not compelled or inspired like so many many others out there to become a hero. Instead, she wanted to use her powers to entertain others and give herself a kind of a career boost. Allison's powers often get downplayed, but they are actually insanely powerful. She can transmute sound into light. She can use this light to do a bunch of different things, including shooting powerful lasers, creating massive light explosions, and completely obliterating her enemies. Like literally, she's turned people into, I mean, nothing, because they were just like vaporized, basically. But that's never really been what Daz is actually about. Instead, she usually just wants to sing and perform while on tour with her band, while being accepted for who she is by the world as well as her family and her friends. Built into her origins was also the mystery of what happened to her mother and a dramatic relationship with her father, who kicked her out after she didn't follow in his footsteps and become a lawyer. And I love that these are like major things in her series, <laughs> as opposed to it being about, you know, like 
constantly fighting bad guys. That happens too, but it's always like, oh boy, how did I get myself in this situation? Number three, Martian Manhunter. John Johns definitely has a strange origin story that sounds so fantastical to imagine, especially when you consider some of the weird coincidences involved in it. He was born as a twin, highly unlikely in Martian culture. His twin, however, was considered a mutant, born without any telepathic abilities. As such, his brother, Ma Alefa Ak, grew up to hate his people and created a virus to destroy them that infected Martians through their telepathy. On Mars, John was a police officer and in an attempt to protect his family against this virus, he tried to convince them not to use their telepathic gifts, which they did try to do, but unfortunately that didn't work. This failed and he lost both his wife. This failed and he lost both his daughter and his wife who went up in flames as the virus preyed on the Martians natural fear of flames, intensifying it to the point that those infected would simply just like burst into flames. Shortly after this, he was pulled to Earth via an experiment of Dr. Saul Erdel, who created a device in an attempt to communicate with aliens, aiming this device at Mars. The device reached across space and time and captured John, who was brought to Earth and made to forget this past trauma through Erdel. The two had basically developed a mental link, and Erdel used this to craft a different backstory for John, which was implanted in the Martian's mind. And he did this kind of as a kindness to like help him get over everything that had happened to him. On Earth, John would disguise himself himself as a human police detective going by the name John Jones. Number 2, Magic. Magic definitely has a pretty weird one when it comes to her origin. And I saw all y'all in the comments on part 1 being like, "But where is Magic? Magic should be on here." You're right, Magic is pretty cool, and that's why she's so high up on this part. She is the younger sister of Colossus and Mikhail Rasputin. Initially, she was kidnapped and held hostage in exchange for the X-Men fighting to free Arcade from Doctor Doom's clutches. Once safe, she ended up moving to the US to live with her brother in the X-Men. However, shortly after this move, young Yana was once again kidnapped, this time by the powerful demon lord Belasco, who sensed great power in her and took her to limbo. Here she would be raised to become Belasco's possible heir and also his tool, with him exerting control over her. Eventually she would return home and would also conquer limbo, usurping Belasco to become the dimension's ruler, forever changed from her terrifying time, being both tormented and kinda trained in the hell dimension. Interesting. Number 1. The Flash what gave the Flash Barry Allen his powers? It turns out he did. Well, initially in the comics, Barry is seen as getting his powers from being doused in chemicals and struck by lightning in his lab. Following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, it was retconned that the lightning that actually struck Barry was in fact kind of because of Barry, who was kind of transformed into lightning following his death in Crisis. In Secret Origins issue number 2 from the 80s, we learn that Barry went back in time and kind of gave his past self a choice between becoming a hero and having a shorter life, or possibly having a longer, more normal life. Barry of course chose lightning, and here we are. So in a way, Barry actually gave himself his powers because of the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is mind mind blowing when you think about it. It's a paradox. Number ten, Plant Man. Granted, there are two different versions of Plant Man in Marvel Comics, but for our purpose, I would like to talk about Samuel Smithers, a man who worked for years with a botanist and was working on perfecting a plant ray that would allow him to increase the IQ of plants, which he believed to be capable of intelligence. Sure, why not? After the botanist he was studying under died, he moved to the U.S. from the U.K., but was unqualified in terms of his schooling to find a job where he could continue his research. Instead, he worked as a gardener, but instead of doing his job of tending to the plants and cutting the grass, he spent more time working on his invention, causing him to get fired. Fortunately, a bolt of lightning struck his device and apparently that was all it needed to become fully functional. Smithers now realized that he could not only increase the plants IQ, but command them with his ray. Does he want world domination to prove to the world his brilliance and terrorize them with his finished invention? Nope, he just wants to get revenge for getting fired. Even Paul, the new plant man's motivation for villainy, is pretty ridiculous. He turned to a life of crime so he could make more than minimum wage after being caught stealing variant covers in the comic book store where he worked. Pretty lame. Although some of those variant covers are really nice, so I kind of get it. Number 9, Sports Master. Lawrence Crusher Croc was one of the worst sportsmen to play any sport, and he reportedly played them all. But he was also the dirtiest player around. He cheated in every sport and became barred from all of them. Infuriated, he decided to turn to a life of crime, despite the fact that he was still a trained athlete, so he could have become like a coach, you know 
and possibly a fitness model. But no, crime was the only path for the Crusher. Oddly enough, in the comic where he was introduced, All American Comics Volume 1, Issue 85, Green Lantern is also keeping up with his career and sports, apparently. Sure, why not? Sportsmaster's master plan is to set up a polo match where they will put all of the audience to sleep and rob them. But Green Lantern attends and handily foils it. Oh, yeah, did I mention he usually just fights with sports equipment? Number 8, Lenny Luthor. In the film Superman 4 The Quest for Peace, Lex has a nephew who helps him escape from his prison sentence while he's working on a road gang. His motivation in the film seems somewhat unclear, appearing to be a villain simply due to the fact that he is related to one without any specific reason for wanting to defeat Superman. Perhaps it is because Lex is the only one who will put up with him because he's super annoying, or he's just doing it for an inheritance? But just because you're related to a villain doesn't mean you have to become their villainous sidekick. I guess this is based around on the old adage, like uncle, like nephew. That's an adage, right? Number 7, Yon Rog. In the MCU film Captain Marvel, Yon Rog is painted as a villain whose motive is to recover and preserve Kree technology that could be used in a war against the Skrulls. His comic book counterpart does not have such a patriotic motivation, unfortunately. Yon Rog is a colonel who, admittedly, is painted as a villain when we meet him in Marvel Superheroes Volume 1, Issue 12, when he orders Captain Marvel to go down to Earth's surface alone as the Kree spaceship arrives at planet Earth. This is apparently against all standard protocol, but this act, as well well as all of his villainous acts, stems from the fact that he is jealous of the captain, who has love of the ship's lovely medic, Una. The crazy thing about this origin story and motivation is that this feud between yon rog and mar continues even after Una dies in the comic. At that point, yon rog just seems to hate mar just for, I guess, thwarting him? Number 6. Calendar Man This Batman villain was first introduced in Detective Comics Volume 1, Issue 259. Where did he come from? Why did he commit the crimes he did? None of these questions are ever really fully answered in that comic, but it looks like he did it because he could? Later incarnations of the Calendar Man are presented as a man obsessed with the calendar and dates. In his original appearance, he was a traveling magician from India who was in town for five days and decided to challenge Batman, performing five crimes in the five days he was there to prove that Batman couldn't catch him. He almost got away with it too, but Batman noticed in the newspaper that there was an announcement about the magician's shows and that he would be there for five days. The same five days that the crime seemed to be committed on. The clue he gave Batman was that he was basing his crimes on the five seasons. Being from India, the fifth season was supposed to be a reference to the monsoon or rainy season, which Batman and Robin took a really long time to figure out. The real mystery here is why a successful magician felt it necessary to goad Batman into capturing him and why he turned to a life of crime in the first place. Like, if you're a successful magician, maybe just stick with that. And at number 5, Rocket Raccoon. Imagine a little raccoon running free, rummaging through trash cans and building a home in the forest. Now take those innocent beginnings and throw in an unknown creepy mad scientist into the mix. This is Rocket's tragic origins. Once a free animal doing his thing, he was kidnapped and experimented on. First they surgically attached cybernetic implants and then gave this innocent animal the mental capacity for not just self awareness, but consciousness as well. Then the newly armed and murderous raccoon became a violent space pirate known simply as just 89P1. Never a good start when your new name starts with numbers. Combined with the psychological effect this would have on his new identity, Rocket was also aware that he was the only one of his kind. Now he leads the lonely life of being possibly the universe's only talking raccoon. In at number 4, Spawn. Typically the rule of thumb when it comes to origins is that the more terrifying the hero, the more tragic their story must be. Spawn fits this formula to a T. Born Albert Francis Simmons, Al was a contract killer and after being betrayed by his best friend, he was murdered on the job. Soon the once highly capable CIA operative is having his soul sent to the bowels of hell. And while there he strikes up a deal with a demon allowing him to return back to earth. However, he never returned in the way that he left. Instead, he was a disfigured demonic entity known as Spawn. To make matters worse and beyond tragic, in the five years that he had been dead, his wife remarried. Although she didn't just marry anyone, she married the man that killed Al while also letting this killer father a child? Needless to say, Spawn was more than a little bummed out about this and not to mention this deal he struck up with his devil was really a ruse to further the demons unholy war against all life. In at number 3, Batman. As sad as Superman's story was and the whole not knowing his parents thing, a much more tragic story would be knowing them, loving them and losing them right before your eyes. This is 
Bruce Wayne's story for all of eternity. He must live with the recurring nightmare of watching his entire life be destroyed in a dark alleyway. Something that would mentally break even the strongest of human beings. When a common street thug robbed the Waynes at gunpoint, they refused to give in to the criminal's demands, causing the man to shoot them both, leaving a young boy alone with his deceased parents in the dangerous streets of Gotham. This was a pivotal moment in Bruce's life and became the obsessive driving factor for really everything. He began training day after day seeking to destroy the entire criminal underworld of Gotham that took his parents. In at number 2, Rorschach. Ranking near the top as one of the more tragic origin stories, we have Walter Kovacs. Born into a terrible home, his father was extremely abusive and his mother was a prostitute. Walter's parents never allowed him to truly experience the world. As such, his view was that the majority of life on Earth had evil intentions. His father would mercilessly beat him while also taking away any form of education in his life. Ironically, Walter was born as a very intelligent child who actually was excelling in his classes and had displayed interest in religious education. His father's violence beat any longing for knowledge out of him though, turning his life into a series of heinous crimes. For example, at just 10 years old, he shoved a lit cigarette into the eye of an older child who was bullying him, leaving the boy partially blinded and sending Walter to jail. This was the turning point where he became the homeless vigilante who wears a literal psychiatric experiment for a mask and goes by the name Rorschach. Last but not least in our number one spot, Eric Draven. This makes our number one spot because the tragedy in this comic book stretches beyond the pages and into the author's real life. The character of Eric Draven in the story of The Crow is extremely dark and was the way for James O'Barr to channel his anger and pain of losing his fiance to a drunk driver. In the story, Eric and his girlfriend Shelly are returning from a romantic vacation when their car breaks down on the side of the road. A gang notices and decides to capitalize on the couple's misfortune. After shooting Eric in the head, he's forced to watch them brutally beat and murder his girlfriend before he too finally dies. Soon Eric is resurrected from the dead, given the gift and curse of immortality while being guided by a supernatural crow. Eric then begins tracking down each of these thugs and makes them each suffer the same brutality that his girlfriend went through. So tragic. I think I might go cry into a pizza now. Kicking off the list at number 10 is the ultimate red skull. In the ultimate universe, Steve Rogers and his girlfriend at the time, Gail Richards, shared a sweet night of romance together way back in 1945, just before he went and got himself popsicled. Nine months later, out popped a sweet baby that the government decided needed to be kept a secret. They took the boy into foster care on a military base, training him to become a super soldier to take the place of his missing and frozen father. He soon became stronger and even more tactically skillful than Captain America was, but even even though he seemed to be the perfect soldier, Rogers' son had in reality been carefully planning his escape. Now fast forward to 1963 when he was finally at the age of 17 and the son went off the handle, removing all the doctors and soldiers at his facility of their lives. If you didn't gather that this guy was absolutely insane, he also used a kitchen knife to remove the skin from his own head, officially and literally becoming the Red Skull. In rebellion against the system that created him, he becomes a mentor unstable assassin and tries to eventually steal Reed Richards plans for the cosmic cube in order to use it to change history so he could grow up with his father. It was absolutely psychotic up until that very last point. Number 9. Dr. Doom Victor Von Doom was the child of Romani people living in Latveria. His mother was a sorceress and after her passing at the hands of Mephisto, resulting in her soul being held hostage by the Hell Lord and the later passing of his father, Victor began to study her books, teaching himself the dark arts while also developing a keen scientific mind which made him a legendary scientist and inventor at a very young age. This this led to him being tracked down by the US military and offered further education in the United States. It was here that he met Reed Richards and the two became intellectual rivals. Doom wanted nothing more than to save his mother from the hold of Mephisto, so he became obsessed with developing a machine that could project the astral form of a being into other dimensions, seeing it as a way to free his mother's soul from Mephisto.
Mephisto. One day, Reed Richards went into Doom's dorm without permission and saw that he was working on the device, but Reed saw it as an unstable dimensional portal to an unknown realm and pointed out all the ways that it wouldn't work. Doom refused to listen since he was peed off at Reed for going into his dorm and looking at his stuff, but also because Doom's plans were based on an understanding of the supernatural that Reed just didn't appreciate. Reed, however, was right, and the machine ended up blowing up in Doom's face, literally, causing him to be disfigured. Despite that initial failure, through magic and other means, once a year, every single year, Doom would challenge Mephisto for the fate of his mother's soul, and he almost always loses. Number 8. Ultimate Mr. Sinister Again, in the Ultimate Universe, Mr. Sinister is reimagined as a former bioengineer who specialized in urban stealth and mind-altering substances to create a super soldier who could evade any form of detection and hypnotically persuade others. Unfortunately, his superiors refused to allow Nathaniel Essex to test his research on human subjects, so he experimented on himself. Himself and acquired superhuman powers. But he also became a schizophrenic street thug with a white tank top, weird tattoos, and a proclivity for gunning down mutants to please his Lord Apocalypse. But his Lord Apocalypse isn't even real and it's just a hallucination slash an effigy Sinister has constructed out of trash. This Lord Apocalypse inside of Sinister's head would preach about ushering in a quote final age of mutant dominance or the end of the world. But to do so, Sinister apparently had to remove 10 innocent mutants from existence. Four issues of the X-Men chasing down a delusional mutant murderer were some of the best from the Ultimate X-Men's extended run. Number 7. Earth-17 Overman On Earth-17 that appeared very briefly in Animal Man issue number 23, superheroes are a product of government experiments. The Superman of this universe is called Overman and he was the first hero with all the other heroes being spawns of his own DNA. That seems pretty normal for a comic book. It feels very the boys, but just like the boys, things get really weird. Overman ends up catching some kind of promiscuously transmitted disease from another person, which somehow drives him completely insane. Overman destroys Earth-17's Justice League and reduces the entire world to rubble. And that was all before he gets his filthy paws on an incredibly powerful doomsday device that he intends to use to wipe Earth-17 out completely. But before he does that, he is temporarily transported to the main DC Universe. The Crisis on Infinite Earths destroys this reality, which seems like an effort by DC to destroy such a naughty Superman story. They even created different, less weird, but still evil iterations of Overman, like an Overman who became allied with the Axis powers in World War II. But the internet, we never forget that kind of thing, you weirdos. Number 6. Dexstar It's true, the Red Lantern of Sector 2814, Dexstar, is an irrationally rage-filled kitten cat, and he's scary, but it's all because he really loved his owner, which is kinda sweet. Dexstar's origin shows the cat Dexter with his owner when she is attacked by robbers who broke into her home. While Dexter tried his best to scratch the attackers, they ended up bringing a close to the life of Dexter's owner. When the police showed up on the scene though, Dexter was kicked out into the streets so he wouldn't contaminate the scene. So this cat lost his owner and his home. That's bad enough, but then two sickos from the streets found Dexter when he was trying to sleep, put him in a sack, and threw him into a river. This unbelievable and unfortunate sequence of events filled this poor little kitty with enough pure unbridled rage that it caught the attention of Atrocitus, who called out to him and made Dexter a Red Lantern. With this newfound power of the Red Lantern ring, the rage kitty exacted sweet revenge on the sickos who sacked him and flew to say goodbye to his owner one last time, saying in his little cat language, I find who hurts you. I kill. I good kitty. Number 5. Spider-Man While Peter Parker's story was not too different from his 616 counterpart, he wouldn't end up being the only Spider-Man in the Earth of 1610. And in fact, Peter would eventually leave the mantle passing it on to someone in his place. Someone new and very different from our Earth 616 Spidey. Yep, we are talking about the beloved Miles Morales. Miles was introduced in the Ultimate Universe and became such a fan favorite that he ended up moving over to Earth 616, even after the Ultimate line was was ended. 
Miles's backstory was that he was a teenage kid who was bit by a genetically enhanced spider exposed to the Oz formula while he was visiting his criminal uncle Aaron Davis. Miles was your average awkward but lovable hero who happened to be a teenager caught in the middle of somewhat of family drama, with his uncle being a criminal and his dad Jefferson drawn into crime alongside his brother Aaron, who ended up working in secret as Fury's eyes and ears in the criminal world, but then later decided to leave it all behind and become a police officer instead. Number 4 Valkyrie Valkyrie had a very different story than our 616 counterpart. Instead of being an Asgardian inhabiting the body of Barbara Norris, who we know as Brunhilde, she was just Barbara Norris. A 19 year old girl who was basically obsessed with superheroes but who had no powers of her own. She was a big Thor fan and so she kind of decided to imitate his look, dressing up like a scantily clad sort of Norse goddess or warrior. Barbara did have some skills as a martial artist in training but was not nearly as experienced as she claimed to be. She wouldn't receive powers until Loki tricked her and her team, the Defenders, into pledging loyalty to him in exchange for said powers. They did not know that Loki was Loki at the time. Valkyrie's gifted powers would grant her superhuman strength, durability, and would allow her to fly. Number three, Iron Man. Iron Man's initial backstory, which got retconned into just being basically a weird anime show, was a lot different than his 616 counterpart. I know that technically this is no longer canon in terms of his backstory within the 1610 universe, as instead his initial origins was moved over to Earth 55921, but before that happened, before it was retconned away, it was canon in the 1610 universe, and I like to remind everyone of just how gloriously bizarre it was. So here we go. Orson Scott Card was the writer behind the series, a sci-fi writer who you might to recognize the name of as he is the author of many other acclaimed science fiction works such as Ender's Game, which if you are like me, you read Ender's Game in school and you were like, this book's actually pretty good. I don't know if that's what happened to you, but that was my story. I feel like that's actually maybe why I like sci-fi today. That might have been the beginning. Maybe. That and Stargate. The Ultimate Iron Man series, however, ended up being a little too out there for comic book fans in terms of what it offered when it came to shaking up Tony's origins. Shook it up a little too much. Tony here was a child who was altered while in his mother's womb by a lab accident. He ended up being born with neural tissue all over him, which made him extremely sensitive to the world around him, but also made him hyper intelligent. His father Howard would create a liquid suit to protect his son from the world he was so sensitive to, but this suit would have its drawbacks and would also make Tony appear blue. So there you go. <laughs> Number 2, Nick Fury. Nick Fury was changed quite a bit in the Ultimate Universe. This is 616 Nick Fury, a former World War II soldier turned super spy whose life was saved by the Infinity Formula. This is 1610 Nick Fury, a former World War II soldier who worked alongside Wilson Fisk's grandfather and Wolverine at the time, but who was taken in by the US military and forcibly experimented on as part of Project Rebirth. In fact, this version of Nick Fury from the Ultimate Universe has an origin story that kind of echoes that of Isaiah Bradley of Earth 616, one of the first super soldiers. In fact, I believe his origins came out only a few years prior to this origins, which was added in sort of later. 2008, we got it for Nick Fury, and I think for Isaiah, we got it like. I want to say 2003? 1610 Nick Fury would be altered by the serum he was given, which of course was the super soldier serum, but he would use his enhanced strength and abilities to help his fellow prisoners escape. This version of Fury was also modeled after Samuel L. Jackson, who would later end up being promised a part in potential future films in order to help make amends after Jackson noticed that Marvel had basically used his likeness in the Ultimate Universe without asking him first. But don't worry, it all worked out. No one got really mad, I don't think about it, so yay. Number one, Black Knight. Dane Whitman has such a random story in the Ultimate Universe. In the main continuity, he is a more medieval feeling hero who fights with an ancient cursed sword that causes him to kind of lose sanity and become more rabid almost each time he uses it. In the Ultimate Universe, he became more machine than man. Originally, he was a man who served in the military, but became a quadriplegic after saving his fellow soldiers in battle. He would then become more of a mech with a human mind, but was considered too insane to actually be used for the team that he'd been recruited on, the West Coast Ultimates. As a result, he spent much of his life inside a stasis tube until he was intended to be used as a weapon against the Ultimates during the events of Earth's 1610 Civil War story. Such a random story. What does this have to do with Black Knight at all? 
from 616. I don't know. Starting us off in at number 10, The Badger. Let's begin our list with one of the more obscure heroes to appear on our countdown today. We are talking Norbert Sykes, aka the Badger. Oh friends, it only gets worse from here. So our buddy Norbert is a Vietnam vet who was initially published by the very short lived Capital Comics. His rights then went to a publisher called First Comics and then after the 90s he was released by Dark Horse, Image and IDW. So yeah, he's been around. A lot. Wonder why. First appearing in a self titled comic, Badger issue 1 in 1983, this is a character who is an expert martial artist. And this is the best part, he can talk to animals. So, how did he get that power? Well, we should probably preface this by noting that he has multiple personality disorder because one of his personalities believed he could talk to animals and that personality referred to itself as the badger. Oh, and it's also worth noting that this persona of his believed he saw God appear as a badger to him. Yeah, like I said, gets worse. Norbert escapes the mental asylum that he's in and becomes a vigilante based off of this. He's also got a ton of other personalities too, including a dog, a nine year old girl, a playboy, and an inner city black kid. So not only is this absurd, it's also a little bit offensive too. It wasn't even the silver age, you guys. <laughs> well, actually, the more racially offensive age was the golden age. But. Up next, number nine. Defensor. The Defensor is another slightly obscure character, and he has a very obscure origin story to boot. Defensor first appeared in Marvel's Superhero Contest of Champions issue 1 in 1982. Before becoming a vigilante, he was a construction worker named Gabriel Carlo Dantes Sopulveda, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Gabriel found an underground passageway that he snuck into after his superiors at his job had gone home for the day. They had previously told him to ignore his discovery. Super stubborn though, he entered and found that the cavern contained a suit of vibranium armor connected to an unknown machine. So what did Gabriel do? Do? Well, he put it on, of course. And as soon as he did, things went to hell. He was attacked by a group of creatures and he fought his way back to the surface and thus began his vigilante career. His death happened off panel in 1995, being reported in Captain America issue 442, so clearly wasn't all that important. Makes sense why he's obscure. Coming in at our next spot at number 8, Elongated Man. Ralph Dibney may be a more respected B tier superhero these days, but that is not something you'd assume based solely off of his origin story. How did he become a superhero? He drank soda. Not even kidding here. Dibney, a young regular dude who just so happened to be obsessed with circus performers, wanted to be like the contortionists and acrobats that he so dearly admired. So he did his research and asked around, and turns out the particular performers he questioned claimed that they drank a particular kind of carbonated beverage that helped them stay in top form. That soda was a drink called Gingold. So what does our pal Ralph do? Well, he went out and bought as much Gingold as he could get his non-powered hands on, and he drank it. A lot of it. Like an unsafe amount of it. And surprise, surprise, it actually worked, but gave him more than he bargained for. He had gained stretchy powers capable of elongating his body in any which way. Now, you're probably thinking this story has some obvious plot holes, right? Can anyone drink a bunch of pop and be granted superpowers? Definitely not. Really, he's lucky that he didn't gain a massive amount of cavities instead. And at number seven, we have Black Condor. There have been three Black Condors over the years, and all three haven't had great origin stories, but let's specifically look at the first, Richard Gray Jr. First appearing in Crack Comics issue one in 1940, Gray got his powers thanks to nuclear exposure from a radioactive meteor. Despite this, he personally believed that this wasn't actually the reason he had gotten powers. This is because he believed he was capable of flight because he had been raised as an orphan by a flock of wild condor birds in the wild. In the wilderness. Which yes, is very, very dumb. When he did return to civilized society, he just happened upon the dead body of a senator named Thomas Wright. So he stole his identity because they shared an uncanny resemblance. How convenient. And yes, he led a double life as a senator while operating as a crime fighter. Yeah, you can see why this character has had so many different iterations. Although they never like quite got it right. <laughs> Up next at six, Green Arrow. Green Arrow's initial origin story is so bad because it's laughable. And that's because it is literally a ripoff of another one of DC's more popular characters, Batman. First appearing in More Fun Comics issue 73 from 1941, DC was clearly trying to capitalize on the success of their cape crusader Batman by creating a similar hero. This hero was Oliver Queen. Queen was an orphan. Queen had a traumatic experience that inspired him to fight crime. Queen was a millionaire philanthropist playboy. 
queen had an arrow cave and an arrow car, and even a young ward. Spot the difference yet? Well, apparently, queen found himself on a deserted island one day and taught himself how to be an expert archer. This is literally the only difference between him and Bruce Wayne when you put it out on paper. Like Batman, but more Robin Hood. Luckily, Queen had become a more independent character in terms of his identity later on, having had a major overhaul and a neat little retcon in the 60s that mixed up his ideologies, ditched his millionaire background, and turned him into a liberal man fighting for the people. Number five. Vision is the human torch. What? How could this be? Well, let me explain. Firstly, we're talking about the first human torch, Jim Hammond, not the second one, Johnny Storm. Vision is not Johnny Storm. Oh man, how many hoops would they have to jump through to make that work? I'd actually want to see that. So, first origin Vision is created by Ultron and sent after the Avengers. His brain patterns were taken from Wonder Man. Okay, cool. Vision believed this was his origin for years. He was sort of the spawn of Ultron, his good son, as it were. But then, Avengers number 129, he was sent back in time to see his true origin. Origin, that he was created inside the mind wipe body of the human torch, but Vision turned on his creator. Now I find this horrifying, I mean, Jim, but this was the catalyst that let Vision think he was a hero and made him feel like he could marry Wanda, the Scarlet Witch, because he was good enough. So, how did this retcon get undone? Well, because we have Jim back now and Namor and him are hanging out again, again, Golden Age bromance. Well, Kurt Busiek hated this marriage and sought to undo it and everything to do with it. So, back to Ultron and a blank body, and the human torch is someone separate. Good, I feel terrible. Like I'm a I'm a body in somebody else's mind by body. Icky. Number four. Thor takes over a body. Speaking of just taking over a body, the original origin of Thor saw him inhabiting the body of Donald Blake. Not that that was his civilian human identity, but that Donald Blake was a person who became overwhelmed by Thor when he wielded the hammer. This was dropped pretty fast, and Blake became Thor's human guise. And he just for a time at the beginning didn't remember he was Thor until, you know, he got more worthy. This change was not done because it was scary, although possession via Norse god is terrifying. Instead, it was because for some readers it was proving confusing, and it raised the question, why why care about Donald Blake at all if he was in no way Thor? So, presto changeo. He's Donald and Thor, and not ruining some poor innocent man's life by making him a target in huge cosmic events he'll never fully comprehend. Number three, Falcon the Brainwashed Gangster. Captain America number 117 saw the introduction of Sam Wilson, and from the start, fans loved him. He was just as patriotic as Steve and an affable, likable character. He was a social worker. However, in his next appearance, the Red Skull would say he was a brainwashed hoodlum named Snap. Wilson, and that he had brainwashed him so that Cap would think he had found the perfect partner, but haha, oh snap, pun intended, he hadn't. The Falcon would break free of his sleeper agentness, but would be more snappy for a bit. This would be retcon, and we would go back to the first origin eventually. Because, well, it's a little racist. Your first African American superhero in American comics, not African, that was Black Panther years earlier, but of American descent, and he starts off as a positive role model only to turn into a stereotypical hood. That's that's gonna be a big look for me. All new Captain America number three would say that this was a persona or alias that Sam used for cover. I like Sam. He's just nice. There aren't enough nice characters out there. They're not boring. Nice isn't boring. Number two, an imp gave the Flash his powers. So the Flash, both Barry Allen and Wally West, got their powers the same way: lab accident and lightning. Which, while it seems pretty improbable, so Flash number 167 to the rescue. Kinda, sorta, not really. This issue asked the question: Did Mopey, an interdimensional imp who claimed he had given Barry his powers, actually do that? And for this issue, the answer was yes. And now Barry had to pay for them. Yes, pay. So he had to work as the Flash, even though he already had a job as Barry. Allen to pay for the chemicals that spilled all over him, turning him into the Flash. So he did. And then he gave the imp his money. And we don't talk about this anymore. Number one, Donna Troy. All of it. Donna Troy, where to begin? So she is the second Wonder Girl, because the first Wonder Girl is Diana, and Donna was created by accident when the creative team from the Teen Titans saw Wonder Girl, a young Diana, who was hanging out with her adult self and thought she was a separate character and sidekick, so they put her on their team. This meant that Donna had to be created as a separate person, and because of this, all of her origins have been a mess for years. She had one simple one for a brief moment, but then it was undone. She has been erased from existence, recreated as a memory, saved by Diana, created as an evil simulacrum by a witch, and now she's infected. It's just a lot of a lot. And it's scary how they won't leave this alone. Just give her one, leave it alone. It's not perfect, but it's fine. Number 10, Norman Osborn. Norman Osborn wasn't always a villain, but many things in his life shaped him to become the greedy, insane, and focused, iconic Spider-Man nemesis we know him as today. It all started when Norman was young. Hearing that his parents were having financial issues, he learned at a young age that it was important to look out for number one above all others to ensure his own survival. Number one is 
Norman Osborn, by the way. His father mistreated him and was known as a failure, and this drove young Norman to strive to do better than his old man, striving for excellence in all things at any cost. When his wife died, it only served to inspire Norman to throw himself into his work even more. He cut out his business partner and began searching for formulas that he could profit off of, ending up discovering and creating the Goblin Serum, which made him smarter and stronger, but at the cost of his sanity. Number nine, Harley Quinn. More of a a psychological horror story as well, Harley Quinn ended up losing her sanity and parts of herself in her love of the Joker. It was her love for him that drove her to a life of crime and made her the villain initially that she became. She's now since found a way out of this darkness, dumped the Joker, and even moved more towards becoming a hero, even teaming up with Batman as his newest sidekick. But you can't deny how dark her origins were. In the limited series Harleen, we get a more sexy version of her fall into a life of crime and a fall into her love for the Joker. But even that shows just how much Harley spiraled down into the beautiful and freeing pit of insanity with Mr. J. It also tells us a tale of her being trapped in Arkham Asylum during a breakout with various villains around every corner, and not all of them are friendly towards Dr. Quinzel. In the end, she is forced to choose between the two sides of herself and ends up shattering into complete insanity after killing a security guard who she kind of considered to be her friend. Turning away from her saner persona of Dr. Quinzel and fully becoming an embodied being Harley Quinn. I just love too that the panel is like literally her shattering. Number eight, Prince Zuko. Okay, so while this might not be a comic book character, I still find Zuko of Avatar to have one of the most traumatic and horrifying stories out there. And I also just like Prince Zuko, so I wanna talk about it. Not only that, but he's just a great villain because a lot of the reasoning behind who he is also helps to justify what he does and makes him a better villain because of that. And that makes him a better villain. A great villain in my mind needs to have a motivation that you can actually connect with. Their need to do something that goes against every moral code that they have learned or that society has has to feel justified to the point that you may even feel bad for them at times or even find yourself rooting for them. After all, we aren't born villainous. It's usually a sense of injustice that makes us feel we have no other option but to break the rules, tear down the establishment, and question our own morals in order to get done what we need done. You have to be pushed to the brink to get to the point that you actually shift into a villain in reality. And Zuko definitely was that. A lot of what he does is that of wanting to to win back his father's love and because he is understandably afraid of his father as well. He became a villain as a result of his punishment at the hands of his father, where he was burned in a forced duel against him and then later exiled as well. Number seven, Carnage. Even before Cletus Cassidy was Carnage, he was terrifying and the villain only has become more terrifying ever since then. Cletus was born into a family with a history of mental health problems and from a young age, it seemed as though there was always something off about him. It's like he was destined to become a villain. He showed all the expectant signs of becoming a psychotic, sociopathic serial killer, and well, that's just what happened. He was raised by a woman who we can only assume was his grandmother, as his mother died seemingly from childbirth. He was also born in Ravencroft, so I feel like that is some kind of foreboding as to what type of child he could grow up to be. His supposed grandmother mistreated him while raising him, and he paid her back in kind by pushing her down the stairs. Yikes! From there, he went to live with a family who is believed to have been his biological father and his step mother, though I don't think that's ever really confirmed, that also didn't end well. Roscoe, his apparent dad, mistreated him as well, and his stepmother ended up dead, caught in the middle of the conflict. Roscoe was arrested because of her death, and Cletus ended up at an orphanage. While there, he unleashed his wrath on fellow orphans and administrators, even killing a few outright, and eventually burned the orphanage to the ground. Seriously, this is just something out of a horror movie. Number six, The Broken. I don't know why, but this villain's tale just always sticks with me for some reason. No matter what, I just think it's that initial panel of Batman's like head and torso together, which is like separated from the rest of his body, but suspended with like thick coiled wires and he's in immense pain. That really does it for me. It just is like, I don't know. I just think it's so scary. The Broken is an alternate version of Batman who comes from the dark multiverse. He appeared in the retelling of Nightfall where instead of Batman winning the day on his earth, he lost in the fight to reclaim Gotham against Azrael, who he'd appointed as his replacement after Bane 
broke his back. Azrael won and became Gotham's protector, Saint Batman, and Bruce became his permanent prisoner. His limbs were removed from his body, but he was kept alive, just as like a head and a torso, kept in immense pain on what I assume is like a life support machine, but also kind of a torture device. He suffered intense migraines and seizures while kept this way. Eventually he was freed by Bane's son and escaped Saint Batman, taking back Gotham, but this entire experience left him broken, turning him into an even worse villain than Saint Batman was. So he like reclaims the city, but you're like, oh no. Oh dear. Not good. Number five, the Joker. There are many variations of the Joker's origin story, with no one version being officially accepted. And that's because he either doesn't remember the real one, doesn't want to tell anyone, or is just so insane that he makes up a new one every single time. It's part of what makes the Joker so compelling. The most popular of his origin stories, though, sees him as a civilian named Jack. Jack leaves behind a career as a chemical engineer to go into stand up comedy. When he fails miserably, he turns to a gang of criminals in order to support his pregnant wife. The criminals name him Red Hood and set up a robbery at a chemical plant, threatening and or taking the life of his family in order to force Jack into working with them. At the plant, the gang are taken down by security and in the terror of seeing Batman as he fled away, Red Hood slash Jack falls into a vat of chemicals. When he emerged being drastically physically altered, he also ends up having a complete and very, very drastic psychotic breakdown and focuses obsessively on Batman for the rest of his life. Number 4, Monsieur Mala and the Brain. When I tell you that a super intelligent French militant gorilla named Monsieur Mala and a disembodied brain belonging to a French scientific genius and master criminal are not only the primary leaders of the Brotherhood of Evil, but are also in a relationship together, then you know this is going to be wild. So, Monsieur Mala and the Brain, who were villains to both the Doom Patrol and the Teen Titans, first appeared in Doom Patrol number 86 in 1964. Brain was once a scientist who experimented on the gorilla who would become Mala, increasing Mala's intelligence. Unfortunately, an accident injured Ernst, the scientist, and Mala had to remove Ernst's brain and place it in a technological holding device to keep him alive and able to communicate. And thus, the villainous duo were born. The two are almost always together, with Mala usually carrying around the brain. Their story, and even the characters themselves, are odd to say the least, but so are the Doom Patrol. So it all just kind of makes sense in the end, doesn't it? Number three. Bane. Bane was born inside the feared Pina Duro prison on Santa Prisca, an island in the Caribbean Sea, after his father, Edmund Dorrance, escaped and had the corrupt government transfer his life sentence to his unborn child. That alone is just so messed up. This child was forced to serve his father's prison sentence is named Bane by a prison warden after he took the first of many lives while still growing up. Bane spends his time in prison building himself into the perfect specimen of physical and mental ability, teaching himself strategy, philosophy, languages, and mathematics while also turning his body into the example of peak fitness and strength. Bane becomes the, quote, king of the prison and is its most feared inmate. Being such an incredible specimen of a human being, Bane is selected for use in a super soldier experimental program being injected with a lethal substance called venom. But unlike any other before him, Bane not only survives, but he finds the venom further enhances his already outstanding physical abilities. But with the caveat that it must be taken every 12 hours. To help that, a system of tubes is installed on Bane to pump venom directly into his system. Them. It's not too long after that that Bane sets his sights on dominating Gotham City and its bat themed protector. In at number two, it's Cheetah. Cheetah was initially a famous archaeologist named Dr. Barbara Ann Minerva. She was a bit, um, I don't know what's the word, quirky? With an obsessive love of artifacts and not much of a care for other human beings. But still, she wasn't exactly evil. Not at first. Minerva stumbled upon an ancient tribe in Africa that was protected by a female guardian with the powers of a cheetah. Super cool. So cool that when she is told the legend of this female hero by a witch doctor, she believes she can become the next cheetah. To do this, Minerva has to become the bride of a plant god by the name of Urz Kartaga. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. She fulfills all of the requirements to become his bride, ingesting a mixture of human blood, berries, and his leaves. But while things seem to be going smoothly, she was not told the key requirement, that she needs to be a virgin. Since Minerva is not a virgin, she is instead cursed to suffer severe pain when she's in human form and have an insatiable bloodlust whenever she turns into Cheetah. And finally 
finally in at number one, it's Armless Tiger Man. If any of you know me, then you know Gustav Hertz was going to make this list. Gustav worked in a mechanical laboratory in Munich, Germany during the 1940s, but unfortunately for Hertz, one day his arms got caught in a machine and had to be amputated. While this is a horrible thing to happen to anyone, Gustav did survive the experience and he was later given reading material on how to operate day to day without arms. Instead, using his mouth and feet to complete daily tasks. Turns out that he was really, really good at this. Hertz developed ridiculous skill in using his teeth and feet. He even took things a couple steps further. He sharpened his teeth into fangs that he could use as weapons and tools, and he even developed above average levels of strength and dexterity in his jaw, legs, and toes, allowing him to bend steel with his mouth, kick really, really hard, and throw daggers with his toes. He ends up proving how capable he was as a World War II enemy of the hero Angel and an enemy of Wakanda, where he was completely destroyed by that era's Black Panther. I will talk about Armless Tiger Man whenever I have the chance, and I am not sorry about it. Number 10, Robbie Reyes, aka Ghost Rider. Making his first appearance in Marvel Comics in 2014, Robbie Reyes was introduced to us as the all new Ghost Rider. His origin story is different and possibly more terrifying than that of his predecessor, Johnny Blaze, but maybe not as scary as that of other fellow Ghost Rider, Alejandro Jones. We are introduced to Robbie as he is struggling to improve his and his little brother Gabe's quality of life, working hard to get them out of the dangerous neighborhood of East LA that they live in. Robbie enters a street race in an attempt to win 50 grand and hopefully get them to a safer neighborhood for good. Unfortunately, the cops chase and corner Robbie when he accidentally turns down a dead end. Unbeknownst to Robbie, the stolen car he entered the race with is filled with drugs, which the cops are after. The officers gun him down and set the car and Robbie ablaze, leaving him to die. Fortunately, the car had a ghost, and this ghost bonds with Robbie, saving him and transforming him into, you guessed it, Ghost Rider. We later find out that the ghost belongs to someone Robbie once knew, making the story even more terrifying. In the spirit of avoiding spoilers, I'd encourage you to read the all new Ghost Rider series to find out more. Robbie Reyes joins the Avengers in Avengers Volume 8. Number 9, Moon Dragon. Moon Dragon is the daughter of Drax the Destroyer. Sort of. I'm getting ahead of myself. Q origin story. Heather Douglas, as she was once known, was the daughter of Arthur and Yvette Douglas. Heather's dad was in a band, and after a successful show in Las Vegas, the family was driving home when suddenly Thanos decided to visit Earth. Thanos observed the family but did not want any witnesses of his arrival, and so he killed them all. Fortunately, or maybe not so fortunately, depending on how you view things, Mentor showed up. He pitied the family and offered Arthur the opportunity of being resurrected. Arthur accepted this offer based around his desire for vengeance, and so he and Heather were resurrected with this purpose in mind. Arthur became Drax and Heather became Moondragon. Moondragon adopted her name after training with monks on Titan and defeating a psychic entity called the Dragon of the Moon. Her power and a quest for vengeance has caused her to do some pretty terrible things, despite also leading her to join the Avengers team for a time, even being offered full membership during the lengthy but original run of the series in Volume 1, Issue 151. Number 8, Beast. Having a similar origin story to that of Bruce Banner, Beast was originally a scientist and gentle giant. Beast was born a mutant but was one of the lucky few who went unnoticed. Save for having a large stature, large hands and feet, and a superior intellect, he appeared normal. His scary origin story was a result of his own hubris. While studying mutant genetics at the Brand Corporation, he became worried that an envious colleague, Dr. Maddox, was attempting to steal his research and formula based around the chemical cause of mutation. Yep. Hank had it all. Not only was he strong, smart, and sitting on a scientific breakthrough, but he had also found love at Brand Corp with Linda, his beautiful and brilliant lab assistant. However, in his pride, he attempted to protect his formula from being stolen by drinking it, causing him to change for what he estimated would be an hour. Unfortunately, the drink caused a Jekyll and Hyde type horror story where Hank would forever become both Jekyll and Hyde, struggling to hold on to his humanity. As both on the outside and occasionally on the inside, he was stuck looking like and feeling like a beast. Number 7, Sunspot. When Roberto da Costa was 14, his superhero story began and his traumatic mutant transformation took place. During the school championship soccer match, Roberto was beaten on the field by members of the opposing team because of the color of his skin. What stops this blatant racism and assault? 
surprisingly not a referee. No, what stops the assault is Roberto's mutation. He turns into a dark ball of energy. Unaware of what is happening, he calls to his friends and teammates, but everyone is terrified of Roberto and flees. His girlfriend Juliana is one of the few who does not run away from him, but instead runs into his arms. However, even Juliana's love is not enough to save this horror story. The two are kidnapped and put with other young mutants. During an escape attempt, a scuffle ensues which results in Roberto being shot at. Juliana jumps in front of the bullets or lasers and dies, sacrificing her life for his. Roberto adopts the mantle Sunspot and ends up joining the Avengers later on, even owning AIM at one point. Number 6, Rogue. You know I had to put Rogue on this list. I figure most of you know the tragic origin story of this Avenger and famous X-Men, but for those who don't, here we go. Rogue was a teenage runaway who eventually found her first love with a boy named Cody Robbins. Cody was also her first kiss, which let's be honest, if we all remember our first kiss, I'm sure it was awkward enough, though not nearly as awkward or dramatic as it was for Rogue, I'm sure. Her first kiss was also when her mutant powers started to manifest themselves. Rogue's powers involve her absorbing life energy through touch, in case you didn't know. This meant that her first kiss and first victim, Cody, was left in a coma. Add that to the fact that she ended up being basically basically raised, used, and somewhat brainwashed by Mystique, and you've got one crazy origin story for our girl Rogue. She joins the Avengers in the Uncanny Avengers series, issue number 4. Up next at 5, Jin Genie. Oh, Jin Genie. We featured this more obscure superhero on several of our lists over the years, so longtime fans of her channel should not be surprised that she made it on this one. Created in 2001 and first appearing in X Force issue 116, Jin Genie Becca Parker is an active superhero whose powers require alcohol in order to function. So she's always drunk, which you can imagine does complicate things in battle. She had pumped a mixture of different alcohols into her bloodstream, which somehow gave her powers that enabled her to create seismic waves capable of leveling buildings. But her power does not work unless she She's borderline blackout drunk. She also died in the same issue in which she appeared, so guess she wasn't that important after all. And at number 4, Jason Todd as the Red Hood. Created in 1983, Jason Todd was the second Robin, the replacement for Dick Grayson as Batman's ward. At first he was a strawberry blonde carbon copy of Dick, but after Crisis on Infinite Earths he got a revamp, becoming a morally ambiguous street kid who would disobey Batman and get into all sorts of trouble. He was so disliked that when DC decided to hold a phone poll that would determine his fate, some dude actually programmed his computer to call and vote a bunch of times in order to push the odds against Jason's favor. The storyline, 1988's a death in the family, saw Jason getting beaten to a pulp by the Joker. Joker with a crowbar. His death would cause great psychological damage to Bruce Wayne, and many comic book creators would eventually speak out about this, saying how it was a pretty terrible thing that DC would do that to a character. The way the phone pole was held and the story was handled was quite controversial. Fast forward to 2005, Jason Todd is resurrected. For years it was believed that he was one of the only three characters who would never be brought back from the dead, the other two being Uncle Ben and Bucky Barnes. But also the Winter Soldier then, you know, is a thing now. At least Uncle Ben's still dead. His return was controversial. Many believed it was gimmicky, while others felt that it took away from the trauma that had really inspired some interesting characterizations in Batman since. And at number 3, Ebony White. Yep, it's a racial caricature. Ebony White was the sidekick of Will Eisner's The Spirit. Often portrayed as a young boy around the age of 12 years old, his age did fluctuate a lot. Towards the beginning of the strip, he was a taxi driver and sometimes The Spirit's personal driver. While we've never been given a full origin story, Ebony's first appearance was on June 2nd of 1940, driving a taxi, noted to be The Spirit's faithful young friend. His speech patterns are also harmful racist depictions of black people. Eisner made the way that he spoke similar to the way that the character Jim from Huckleberry Finn speaks, making him appear to be uneducated and trained to obey his white master. What's worse is how Eisner would later describe the character. I quote, At the time, humor consisted in our society of bad English and physical difference in identity. So Eisner didn't even admit that it was racist, and has even discussed how Ebony has a slave mentality. Ah, 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 it's just bad. Just bad. And at number two, Barbara Gordon as Oracle. Although Barbara Gordon has an origin story about how the daughter of GCPD Commissioner James Gordon became a vigilante and a member of the Bat family, the more controversial origin story of hers is when she became Oracle. Barbara has been kicking around since 1967 when she first appeared in Detective Comics issue 359, but it wasn't until 1989 that she took up the mantle of Oracle after she was paralyzed by the Joker in Batman the Killing Joke. That is where the controversy lies. The character was unnecessarily shot 
shot and crippled by the Joker and implied to be sexually assaulted as well, as a means to prove a point to Batman and screw with James Gordon. She was a mere plot device. According to Alan Moore, who penned the story and has since expressed regret concerning the treatment of Barbara in it, editor Len Wayne has been quoted as saying, Yeah, okay, cripple the b when Moore had asked about approval for the story arc. Speaking of things that are incredibly offensive, that brings us to our final number on our list. In at number one, Tyrock. Tyrock is one of DC's first black superheroes, which is definitely something to be admired, except for the fact that most of his stories, including his origin, were incredibly racially insensitive. Tyrock, whose name means Scream of the Devil in his native language apparently, was a member of the Legion of Superheroes who has a reality warping Scream. The character, created by Carrie Bates and Mike Grell, was a racial separatist. Instead of just having the character be a hero who just so happened to be black, they made a big deal about his race. Tyrock hails from a fictional island called Marzal, which is filled with former African slaves who hate the Legion of Superheroes. They're segregated on the island. And when the Legion visits the island, Tyrock tells them, I quote, Racial prejudice died out long centuries ago, but perhaps the Legion is behind the times. That was in the 1940s, people. That is some f***ed up stuff coming from white writers and white editors at DC. On top of that, co-creator Mike Grell was rumored to have hated having to create Tyrock, so he deliberately made him look ridiculous. I quote, I gave him a silly costume. It was somewhere between Elvis's Las Vegas costume and something you would imagine a pimp on the street corner wearing. Number 10, Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler. Oh boy. I still think to this day, one of the weirdest facts about him is that he's the son of Mystique and Azazel, a demon who claims to be the devil. Azazel is also weird in the sense that he comes with his own lore as part of a race of demonic mutants known as the Neophem, who were opposed to a race of angelic looking mutants known as the Chearophem, that apparently Angel is also one of. Nightcrawler would be abandoned shortly after he was born by his mother, who was fleeing an angry mob. He'd be taken in by a family tied to magic, the Zardoses, and later would also end up dating his foster sister, Jermaine Zardos, who we'd later come to know as Amanda Sefton. Which I mean, granted she was kind of undercover at the time, but still Still, I feel like if you know your foster sister, you know you know who your foster sister is. Don't think her being like, my name is Amanda, would change it for me. I'd be like, wait, but you look exactly like my foster sister. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you love when we talk about weird stuff, we have a weirdest playlist for you, you to check out. So go check that out after. Number nine, Booster Gold. Booster Gold is a time traveling hero from the future. And from the look of him, you might not even guess this, considering that for a hero who should hail from a more advanced timeline, he often isn't known for being one of the best or the brightest. Booster Gold was actually Michael Carter, who was born during the 25th century in Gotham. His dad left his family when he was young to pursue his obsession with gambling and leaving his family deep in debt. In order to help his sick mother, Michael would eventually also follow in his father's footsteps to earn the money he needed to help her get well again. His mother would end up being saved, but following the revelation of how Michael had gotten that money through gambling, was also shamed by her son's actions. Michael decided to make things right and set it on a path to make something of himself. And while working as a security guard at a museum, was inspired by the heroes on display there, stealing tech from the museum to travel to the past and become a hero himself. Also using his knowledge of the past that he had as someone who came from the future. So he's actually a security guard from the future with basic museum tech, using it to parade around as a hero, which is pretty funny. Especially when you consider Skeets his, his little droid that flies around and helps him out actually is just like basically security tech from the museum. It's like one of those things that's supposed to walk you around the museum and be like, this exhibit is this. Here is the history. Number eight, Jean Grey. Jean Grey is not a character you likely think of when you think of unbelievable origins. However, there are some things that I feel like we gotta talk about. Probably you wouldn't think of that because her origin is often explained away at, by her status as a mutant. But trust me, Trust me, it, it gets kind of weird. Jean was only a young girl when her powers first manifested, with her mind becoming bonded to the mind of a young schoolmate, just as said schoolmate was hit by a car and basically lay dying. This left Jean pretty much traumatized, and her parents ended up reaching out to Professor Charles Xavier eventually for help. Xavier ultimately placed a mental block in Jean's mind in order to protect her against her insanely powerful telepathic abilities. Years later, Jean would join his school for gifted youngsters, and Charles would also 
also creepily fantasize about what a potential romantic relationship would be like with Jane. Pretty weird, considering everything else we now know. Although, he knew this would of course never be possible. Not because he was, you know, years her senior, as well as her teacher and her mentor, but because he was confined to a wheelchair. Those are his thoughts, not mine. Oh Charles. Number 7, Hitman. Definitely a strange one, and thank you to Pablo in the comments for the suggestion, um, who suggested it on my part 1. Well, I'm not really sure if it was intended as a suggestion, but that's definitely how I took it. So, here we go. Hitman is Tommy Monahan, the son of a lady of the night who was based in Gotham. His mom, named Catherine Monahan, took to naming her children after the men who used her services and who were the biological fathers of said children in an attempt to um shame them. However, Tommy's father, Tom Dawson, was not a fan of this and actually warned Catherine, threatening her life, that she should not do that. Stubborn, she did so anyways with him, which resulted in her life and the life of her offspring, save Tommy, being lost. Tommy would grow up in a Catholic orphanage and would go on to serve in the military before becoming a hitman. Despite the fact that he was an assassin in the DC universe, Tommy was still considered to be a hero because he avoided killing people who he deemed to be good. During one of his jobs, he ended up in a confrontation with a bloodline parasite, a dragon-like parasitic alien, who attempted to kill him by drinking his spinal fluid, because that's that's what those guys do. The parasite's attempt failed, and afterwards, Tommy observed that he now had low-level telepathic powers. This is a true story from a comic. I mean, it's not a true story, but in the comics world, it's a true story. That happened. Number 6, The Fantastic Four. While the Fantastic Four have become an iconic superhero team as Marvel's first family, when you think about it, their origin story is, uh, pretty strange. Reed Richards was the mastermind behind their transformation, which actually happened not by his own design, but kind of by accident. After facing the threat of a loss of funding for his Starship project, Reed decided to prove the merits of said project by taking his Starship, the Marvel One, on a test flight, which would thereby prove its worth should the flight be successful. Which of course Reed was like, it'll be successful, it'll be great, we're not going to worry about the fact that I shouldn't even legally probably be doing this. While his friend Ben Grimm was always set to pilot this flight, Reed also also agreed to bring along his girlfriend, Susan Storm, and her younger brother, Johnny, who at that time really had no space or flight qualifications to speak of that I know of. And thanks to a storm of cosmic rays, the four were forever changed by the flight as we know. It's weird that the four of them were the ones that ended up on it. Especially Sue being like, hey, can I bring Johnny, my brother? <laughs> it's like, sure, why not? We got four seats, let's do it. Number five, Dr. Manhattan. John Osterman's origin story as Dr. Manhattan is truly horrific. John found himself trapped inside a test chamber when he went to retrieve his watch, as it underwent a scheduled experiment. The experiment caused John to be taken apart at an atomic level, removing his intrinsic field, which is a term used in Watchmen to describe what holds atoms together, the force that does that. It's not actually a true scientific term, fun fact. As such, he was granted powers over the intrinsic fields of all things, using his powers to build himself a body three months later and physically manifesting in the cafeteria of his workplace. John's life would be forever changed and in becoming a god, he would not only look different, but would also become less human as the years went on, experiencing a detached feeling from life on earth. Number 4, Batman. Bruce Wayne was just a young boy when he lost his parents. They were both killed point blank in front of him one night after the family had left the movie theater where they just watched Zorro and attempted to take a shortcut down an alley. A thief named Joe Chill killed them during a robbery, leaving Bruce alone in the world save for the family butler, Alfred, who would become like a father to him. It was this tragic start to his life that caused young Bruce to grow up fast and run in with a bat that inspired him to become the Dark Knight of Gotham known as Batman. It's also been argued countless times over that this traumatic event made young Bruce unstable, which is perhaps why he has turned to a life of vigilantism, unable to heal the mental wounds his parents' tragic deaths caused. Number 3, Gamora. Gamora is the last surviving member of her race known as the Zen Huberis. They were a peaceful people who were all killed by a religious order when they resisted their attempt at dominance in the galaxy. Thanos managed to save Gamora and raised her as his daughter, turning her into his own weapon, modifying her with tech to grant her superhuman abilities. He planned on using her to defeat the villain known as Magus, who was also Thanos' enemy. While Thanos seemed to occasionally show Gamora fatherly affection, there would come a time when she would turn on him 
acknowledging him as someone who had used her for his own means and denouncing her allegiance to him. Seeing him for what he was, a mad tyrant and a villain who was selfish and cold hearted, seeking only to bring death to whatever planet, galaxy or universe he was in. Number 2. Raven If we go back to the original New Earth continuity, Raven's origins are pretty freaking dark. Her mother was part of a cult and when she tried to escape and leave, the members prevented her from doing so by summoning a powerful demon named Trigon. This demon then forcefully mated with her. From this, Raven was conceived. She was born Angela Roth and raised to control her emotions, to help prevent her from losing control of her demonic powers and to basically prevent her from giving in to the dark side. She was sort of like a Jedi, but with a demonic heritage. When she learned of Trigon's evil plans, she attempted to stop him and sought help from the Justice League, who actually refused to help her because of her demonic heritage, prompting Raven to work harder to become a hero and putting her on a path to become one of the Teen Titans. Number 1. Spawn Spawn was originally Albert Al Simmons, an assassin who was murdered by his friend while on a mission. He then is condemned to a life in hell, but makes a bargain to return to the land of the living so that he can see his wife one last time. However, he must agree to become a hell spawn in order to do so. The unfortunate side effect of which, that he doesn't learn until later, is that he will forget his memories somewhat. So he returns to life, but only as a faint recollection of his past. And what's more, his body is still kinda undead, making him appear as a horrific monster. So even if he had remembered his wife's name straight away, he would not be able to reveal himself to her. When he finally does remember his wife, he discovers she is remarried to one of his friends and they now have a daughter. He also realizes that 5 years have passed since his death. Not what he had originally expected when he made that bargain. Spawn, lost in the world, is now forced to search for a new purpose while also conserving his powers as once they're fully used up, he will return to hell. In at number 10, Doctor Strange. Doctor Stephen Strange was once a world renowned surgeon. With such a high ranking position in his field, many viewed him to be a bit of an egotistical jerk from time to time. In a freak car accident that nearly took his life, the doctor woke up in a hospital bed with his hands floating in cast before his very eyes. His entire profession depended on just how steady his hands were, and now with such terrible nerve damage, he would never be able to operate on patients ever again. You can imagine the psychological toll that this would play on your brain, having your entire livelihood ripped away from you after one accident. Luckily in his search for a cure, which just seemed like a pipe dream at the time, he soon found himself in the Himalayas. After meeting the Ancient One and undergoing rigorous training, he was finally able to let go of the pain that this accident had caused him. In at number 9, Superman. We all know the story of Superman, but the majority of people gloss over just how tragic this origin truly is. Perhaps it's because after his ship crashed land on earth, he was raised by such a wholesome family that fostered him and his alien powers. When you really think about it though, his home planet had exploded, which completely wiped everyone that loved him. A whole world full of people just like him was now gone. He now has the awful task of being raised in a world where he is the obvious outcast. Imagine finding out that you were adopted and then discovering that you're this mysterious alien. It's hard enough to discover your own life's purpose, but for Clark Kent, most of the time he would be dealing with split personalities his entire life. He has to be both Clark Kent, the average human, while simultaneously exploring his powers to rid the planet of evil. In at number 8, Daredevil. As the story goes in the first issue of the 19th 1964 Daredevil series, a young Matt Murdock is walking home from school when in the distance he sees trouble brewing for an elderly man. Little did the man know, a truck was heading in his direction and death was knocking at his door. Not on Matt's watch though. In a heroic act, the teenager throws himself in front to save this elderly man. In the process of doing such a selfless act though, his eyes are sprayed with these radioactive chemicals. The man was saved, Matt survived, but the chemicals had left him permanently blind. Nothing says tragic like a teenager with his whole life in front of him being told by a doctor that he would be blind for life. Luckily this is the comic book world so he was able to spin this into a strength and become the superhero that we know and love 
as Daredevil. However, in any other world, this story of a hero sacrificing himself for the betterment of others is inherently a tragic tale. In at number 7, Spider-Man. The majority of these tragic stories begin with the hero having no powers for which a tragic occurrence then leads to them either discovering or developing them. For Peter Parker, he had already been bitten by a radioactive spider that gifted him with his new powers. Although with his newfound powers, he believed that this was his way to make some money in show business. However, with this distraction now in his life, it pulled him away from being at home to watch over his elderly Aunt May and Uncle Ben. As fate would have it, an intruder burst into the home, attempting to rob the place only to fire a single fatal shot at Uncle Ben. Peter largely blamed Uncle Ben's death on himself for being too late to save him, even tossing his Spider-Man attire into a closet wishing that he had never left. This is a tragic story not only because Peter takes the full blame of this freak occurrence, but it soon fills him with vengeance which is not a great way to start a hero's journey. In at number 6, Dr. Manhattan. Born as Jonathan Osterman, the doctor had lived a very normal life. It's July of 1959 and Dr. Osterman was in love with a woman named Janie Slater. She was a physicist like John, and at 30 years old, he had his whole life in front of him. The two were first introduced to each other by a good friend of John's from college named Wally Weaver. After leaving the intrinsic field laboratory one day with Wally and Janie, John realizes that he left his watch inside. Little did John know was that the intrinsic field room was on a timer and when he entered the door closed behind him, locking John inside. When he tries to open it, Wally is on the other side and is quickly turning very pale. Wally realized that there was nothing that they could do to save him. And after being blasted by radiation, his colleagues watched helplessly as it essentially just vaporized him. This tragedy could be the origin of when Manhattan really started to separate himself from the rest of humanity. Additionally, he was blamed for the death of his friend Wally, who would pass away from cancer 20 years later. Man, that's tragic. In at 5, Black Widow. Black Widow has another well known origin story, one that we might even see play out in the MCU in the near future in the character's solo feature. And it's likely that it will remain just as dark as it is in the comics. Despite debuting in Tales of Suspense issue 52 in 1964, it wasn't until the 70s that we got more information on the character's past. The character of Ivan Petrovich tells Daredevil in the comics that he was given custody of Natasha by a woman who died immediately afterwards during the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942. He raised her, turning her into a Soviet spy. This was later retconned though, showing Natasha being raised in the USSR's Black Widow Ops program, with Ivan taking her to Department X where she was brainwashed and trained in the covert Red Room facility, where she's biotechnologically and psychotechnologically enhanced. She's fed false memories in order to keep her brainwashed, and the KGB even arranged a marriage between her and a Soviet test pilot. He's eventually taken away by the KGB for a new program and Natasha is told that he's dead. Later, when she tries to defect from the Soviet Union, she ends up getting kidnapped, put back in the Red Room, and brainwashed yet again. But luckily Hawkeye, who at the time she had a romantic relationship with, ends up aiding her and breaking her free from the psychological conditioning, with Natasha later joining the Avengers. In at 4, Sentry. When we first met Sentry in 2000, he was a middle aged overweight man named Bob Reynolds, who just so happened to remember he's a superhero with the power of one million exploding suns, derived from a special serum, although that's been questionably retconned in later years. But despite that one fluid detail, Sentry's first story follows him remembering that he was a hero, and trying to figure out why the rest of the superhero community does not remember that. It's soon revealed that Sentry had voluntarily erased his own memories, working with Mr. Fantastic, Doctor Strange, and a mechanical robot named Clock in order to make everyone forget. All thanks to Sentry's other, more sinister half, Void, a villain of mass power who threatened the Earth, and is one in the same as Sentry. Also, side note, he struggles heavily with addiction to boot. Imagine that, sacrificing your entire memory, your entire life, and making everyone forget who you are, all just to stop the evil that brews within you and threatens to kill all life on Earth. Yeah, that's, that's some terrifying existential stuff right there. And at number 3, The Hulk. We all know that Bruce Banner became the Hulk thanks to being exposed to a gamma bomb, causing him to be affected by gamma radiation. But his origins do go beyond that, especially as far as his rage is concerned. We learn in issue 312 of The Incredible Hulk from 1985 that Bruce was the victim of child abuse. His father was a violent alcoholic who beat him and murdered Bruce's mother, accidentally, but still, murder is murder. In addition to that, his father hated him for his intelligence and would lash out at him irrationally. Then in college, Bruce would get violent back, beating up his father over his mother's grave. So the fact that he becomes the Hulk, someone with uncontrollable anger, thanks to the gamma radiation accident, shouldn't be much of a surprise. The Hulk was always inside of him, but now manifests as his big green other half. In at number 2, Carol Danvers. Carol Danvers has been through some major crap. 
And she's had multiple origin stories of sorts too. One for becoming Miss Marvel, one when becoming binary, and another prior to when she became Captain Marvel. Although the latter two kind of bleed into one another. So when Carol was Miss Marvel and part of the Avengers, there was a storyline in which Marcus, the son of Immortus, a major Avengers villain, shows up and kidnaps Carol, takes her back to his dimension, brainwashes her, rapes her, impregnates her, and then uses her pregnancy for her to give birth to him so he can return to Earth in a physical form. Yeah, that's messed. He grows from child to full man in a matter of moments, then kidnaps Carol again. All of which none of the Avengers bat an eye over. This is not something that went over well with fans, critics, or Carol herself. After some aid from the X-Men and Professor Xavier, Carol comes back and gives the Avengers hell for abandoning her in her time of need. She later becomes binary, where she gets a major cosmic power boost, but later thanks to more traumatic stuff between her and Rogue, with Rogue absorbing her entire personality, she ditches the X-Men and binary. Eventually she takes on the Captain Marvel mantle and ends up struggling with alcoholism, something that Tony Stark helps her out of since he once was a past alcoholic himself. All in all, she's gone through quite the journey to become the woman she is today. You can also see why the MCU decided to leave out that rather traumatic Marcus storyline out of the Captain Marvel movie too. And finally, in at number one, Yellow Jacket. Hank Bim is another character with various different origin stories for his various different personas. It's also worth noting that he struggled with major mental health issues over the years, some of which weren't developed the most empathetically by some writers. Now, at the time when Hank's Yellow Jacket persona is revealed, Hank had just created Ultron and had already had two nervous breakdowns in the comics. The most recent being because he realized he was the one responsible for creating one of the Avengers' most deadliest foes. Out of that second nervous breakdown, Yellow Jacket is born, a bombastic, prideful superhero of sorts who claims to have killed Hank Pym, and then kidnaps Janet, to whom he proposes to. Janet, slightly delusional, sees this as a way of getting over Hank and as a chance to finally be happy. Ouch. Hank eventually reveals that he's Yellow Jacket and that Yellow Jacket was created thanks to a schizophrenic break of Hank's, along with accidentally spilling some untested chemicals. Hank's problems only get worse from there. But that is a story for a whole other video. Number 10, Spider Woman. I love Jessica Drew, but her origin story really is just straight up weird. I even was explaining it to someone who is not familiar with her as Spider Woman the other day, and even just hearing myself explain, it sounded weird to me too. I was like, just go with me here. It's a strange story. Jessica Drew was very young when she got sick, possibly because her father had actually wanted to experiment on her. That's, I believe, I don't know if we've ever pinpointed that, but see likely, and had chosen to expose his family to a radioactive area. Her dad ended up curing Jessica of her illness by giving her a serum based off of spiders and putting her into stasis basically for years so she could heal. Now, By the time that she was healed and emerged from the tube she was held in, she was a young adult, although admittedly, she was, as I said, healed, and she now had superpowers. But what she didn't have at the time, of course, was life experience, because she had pretty much spent all of her time in a tube. She had spent most of her life thus far in a tube in a suspended state, so it's easy to see how initially she got used as a pawn of hydras. There is also a version of her origin where Jessica was actually a woman who started out as a spider who simply evolved into a human form, which is even more bonkers of a story. Fortunately, this was later retcon to be a false memory implanted in Jess's mind. So that's how we make sense of that. Although it is still a weird detail that someone would be like, yeah, I'm just going to mess with her and make her think she evolved from a spider. Why not? And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you love when I talk about weird comic book stuff, I love talking about weird comic book stuff, check out our Top 10 Weirdest Playlist. We all talk about weird stuff over there. It's a lovely playlist. Number 9, Captain Marvel. Carol Danvers' origin started out weird and only got weirder with time, it seems. This one is weird to me, especially because I feel like it was kind of given a retcon that it didn't really need, but it got it anyways. But at the same time, I also acknowledge that the retcon may have simply been added to make Carol's origins make more sense or appear more streamlined. Carol Danvers was a security guard who ended up acting as an ally for and falling in love with the original Marvel. At one point, her life was endangered by Marvel's vengeful rival Yon Rog when the device known as the Psyche Magnetron exploded. In that moment, Carol wished that she was more like Marvel, and so she became as such because that's what happens when you get caught in a Psyche Magnetron explosion. She ended up manifesting similar powers and adopting the superhero moniker Miss Marvel. Years later, Carol has taken up the mantle of her former mentor, Captain Marvel, which is why we know her as such now, and has also learned that apparently this whole time 
On her mother's side, she was actually half Cree, which is the same alien race that Marvel belonged to, which also, I guess, in part, accounts for her abilities manifesting. Though I think it's kind of fine that, like, kind of a wishing machine just allowed her to have those abilities. I think that makes sense too, but half Cree, let's do it. Number eight, Bouncing Boy. Bouncing Boy is Chuck Tane. And not only is he ridiculous in terms of his own abilities and appearance, but so is his origin story. He's known for being a member of the futuristic superhero team, the Legion of Superheroes. Or he's known for eventually being a member of that team. This team hails from the 31st century, where they're teen heroes who are known not just for protecting the Earth, but also any other worlds that belong to the group known as the United Planets. Bouncing Boy himself initially was not considered good enough in the original continuity to join the Legion, trying out and failing to be accepted twice prior to finally securing his place on that team. Probably because of how odd his powers are, honestly. One day during a sports match, he made the mistake of drinking super plastic fluid by accident, which is what gave him the ability to basically inflate himself and turn himself into a human bouncing rubber ball. Why we call him Bouncing Boy. Number seven, Hellboy. Some might not think Hellboy's origins are that weird, but I would challenge that line of thinking. I think Hellboy's origins only seem normal because we know him so well at this point. But it's pretty weird that an organization who is kind of known for hunting monsters would retrieve him after he was summoned by a dark World War II German cult and apparently is destined to bring about a massive apocalyptic event and yet would still choose to raise and adopt him and just raise him up among their ranks. It just seems like an odd choice, I think, when we consider his origins. I love it for him, but it's weird. Number six, Vampirella. Vampirella has to have one of the weirdest origin stories ever. Possibly one of the reasons that I love her so much. Especially when you consider how many times it has straight up changed on her. She's had a lot of retcons in her origins. I think my favorite one, though, my favorite version of her origin, though, is still kind of the weirdest by most people's standards. Her first origin. Although to me, this one actually feels a lot simpler than the rest of what we were given for Vampy later on with Lilith and Hell and all that stuff. I'm not talking about that aspect of her origin, but instead I'm talking about Draculon, the original Draculon, which initially was a whole other planet in outer space where a bunch of other alien vampires like Vampirella lived. Instead of having water on their planet, blood flowed through and around it. But after a catastrophic event where all the blood basically kind of like dried up, they had like a major drought, Vampy left her homeworld for Earth. She even makes her way to Earth in a very interesting fashion, basically kind of like hijacking the spaceship of some astronauts who crash landed on Draculon after discovering that the life force energy powering them, their blood, is actually drinkable to her and can act as a food source. Very strangely convenient, and I love it. Number five, Rorschach. Walter Kovacs was raised by a mother who mistreated him, basically resenting his very existence. This mistreatment inspired Walter to stand up to those who would hurt others. These beliefs led to Walter himself to brutally confront his own schoolyard bullies, even going so far as to blind one of them as a child. Walter became a sociopath because of how he was treated when he was younger, believing in a strict moral code and using that as his own vigilante compass to decide who should be punished and how severely. His mother was a prostitute and when he learned of her death at the hands of her pimp, who force fed her Drano to kill her, he only responded with one word, good. Ooh, dark. Number four, Jessica Jones. In the Netflix Jessica Jones series, we learn that Jessica Jones became a detective and hero in essence because of the fact that she was assaulted and mind controlled by Purple Man, who made her to do all sorts of things that she didn't want to do. In the Alias series, Jessica Jones attempts to confront her trauma, wrestling with just how much control Kilgrave actually had over her, and if it's possible that part of her motivation for all of the things he had her do could have actually come somehow from within herself. This is a common thing with victims of this type of assault, wondering about about how much responsibility or control you actually had in that situation, and in a sense, blaming yourself for what happened to you. But beyond this, Jessica Jones's original origins, how she got her powers, actually involved a massive vehicular collision, where her entire family was killed except for her. And it's implied that she only survived because she was exposed to radioactive materials, whose containers were damaged in the accident, leaking out and interacting with Jessica. Jessica's original last name had been Campbell, and she didn't get her name Jones until she was later adopted by Alyssa Jones and her husband after Jessica's family's death. Ugh. 
actually, Jessica seems to be a bit of a cursed name in the Marvel Universe. There's a lot of Jessicas with dark origins. Number 3. Magneto Well known for a long time in the comics by his alias Eric Magnus Lencher, Magneto's original name and origins revealed that he grew up as a young Jewish boy during World War II named Max Eisenhardt. His family left Germany when things started to get bad, retreating to Warsaw where they lived in the Warsaw Ghetto. Eventually, Max was taken to the extermination camp at Auschwitz after he and his family attempted to leave the Warsaw Ghetto. Following his time at Auschwitz, Max shed his original name and adopted another so that he might better fit in with his wife Magda's Romani people. When it comes to Magneto's backstory, he is no stranger to discrimination and it is his suffering and the suffering of others that he has witnessed that has inspired him to become the villain and the sometimes hero that we know today. Number 2. Red Hood When it comes to Jason Todd's transformation from Robin to Red Hood, there was a ton of dark events that came into play here, which caused Jason Todd to go from hero to villain and then of course to anti-hero. Todd was seemingly one of the permanent deaths in comics after he was beaten to near death by the Joker following being sold out by his own birth mother who he then even still fought to free before being killed in an explosion. We thought we'd never see him return but he was later brought back using the Lazarus Pit and then was trained by Ducra of the all cast and join the League of Assassins for a time. When he finally returned to Gotham, it was originally as the villain Red Hood, seeking brutal justice, and later on, as Joker would say in Three Jokers, Book One, becoming one of his own villainous creations. Ooh, so dark. When you realize you've become a thing you didn't want to be and someone evil made you that. Eee. Number one, Wolverine. Wolverine has more trauma in his life than all the X-Men put together. Actually, he's probably got more trauma in one pinky than all of the X-Men. The only thing that protects Wolverine from the darkness of his own a multi chapter tragic origins is the fact that his brain actually also uses his healing factor to basically rid him of undesirable or painful memories. Young James Hallett's powers first manifested when his birth father killed his foster father, the husband of his mother. In a rage, James used his bone claws to kill his birth father, Thomas Logan, and his mother, still recovering from the loss of her firstborn son, severely traumatized, then took her own life. There are a lot of things that came after that when it comes to Wolverine's story and his past, pretty much all of them being wrapped up in some kind of traumatic experience.